The hearing will come to order. Welcome to the Committee on the Budget's hearing examining perspectives from outside experts on oversight of the Congressional Budget Office. Before we begin, I ask unanimous consent that, consistent with Clause 4 of House Rule 16, the Chairman be authorized to declare recess at any time. Without objection, the request is agreed to. Today we are concluding our five-part series of oversight hearings on CBO, a nonpartisan support agency that has played a vital role in the Congressional budget process for more than 40 years. Established by the Congressional Budget and Impoundment Act of 1974, CBO directly assists the House and Senate Budget Committees and supports the work of Congress with its nonpartisan budgetary analysis. Even though CBO has existed for decades, this oversight series marks the first time the agency has ever undergone a comprehensive review. Over the years, CBO's mission of supporting the congressional budget process has remained the same. But as we have learned during these hearings, demands on and ex expectations of the agency have evolved. So while the purpose of this series has certainly been educational, it's also helped us identify and consider potential areas for improvement. At the end of the day, we want to make sure CBO has everything it needs to fulfill its mandate of supporting Congress in the 21st century effectively and efficiently. We started this series by discussing CBO's organizational and operational structure with the director, Dr. Keith Hall. In our second hearing, we began to explore some of the more technical aspects of how CBO actually crafts the impartial work products Congress relies on to make informed legislative decisions. During our third hearing, we took a deeper dive into CBO's use of models as a tool in scoring legislative proposals and what kinds of assumptions are made in that process. And last week, we heard from interested members of the House who shared their ideas for improvements at CBO, as well as their perspectives on challenges they've experienced when interacting with the agency. Today, we will close out the series. My thanks to the witnesses joining us as we do so. In our first panel, we will hear from two former CBO directors who guided the agency at different stages in the CBO's history. Each director was appointed during different eras of Congress, and both were selected to serve based on their ability to perform the duties of that role, not because of their political affiliations. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Alice Rivlin, who was the very first director of CBO and served as head of the agency for eight years. She also has served as OMB Director and Federal Reserve Board Vice Chairwoman. Also joining us today is Dr. Douglas holtz aiken who was appointed as Director of CBO in 2003 and led the agency for nearly three years. He served on the President's Council of e Economic Advisors, and he's currently President of the American Action Forum. I look forward to hearing the unique insights Dr. Rivlin and Dr. holtz aiken can share about CBO's past operations as well as different challenges faced over the years. In the second panel, we will hear from budgetary policy and process experts who can provide valuable outside perspective. Joining us from the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget is the organization's president, Maya McGinnis, known for her expertise in budget, tax, and economic policy. Maya also heads the Campaign to Fix the Debt. Maya has been the, at the forefront of budget issues for years and is able to discuss the importance of CBO within the context of the larger budget process. Maya is joined by Sandy Davis from the Bipartisan Policy Center. Sandy currently serves as senior advisor for the organization's economic policy project, and he also has a wealth of knowledge about the budget process. Prior to working at BPC, he devoted more than 30 years of service to CBO, including as Associate Director for Legislative Affairs. He was the first person to hold that position. Before joining CBO in 1996, Sandy specialized in budget process at the Congressional Research Service. Through these CBO oversight hearings, we've learned much about the inner workings of CBO and the challenges the agency faces as it provides Congress with nonpartisan budgetary analysis. Our conversations today will help the committee continue to determine actionable solutions for CBO's ongoing success. As we've considered this very important topic, two consistent themes have arisen, the desire to improve the accuracy of CBO's work and the desire to increase transparency at the agency. Without question, the simple exercise of having 
these hearings has already enhanced communication between CBO and Congress, and I believe this exchange is only made better through regular oversight. That means not waiting another 40 years for a comprehensive review and consideration of how to update the agency for the 21st century. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that our goal here is to make sure CBO has the tools it needs to effectively support the congressional budget process. Especially with a recently formed select committee, there's genuine interest on both sides of the aisle to have a working budget process. CBO undoubtedly plays an essential role to that end. I look forward to the conversations ahead and continuing to engage in a productive, bipartisan dialogue about CBO. Thank you, and with that, I yield to the ranking member, the gentleman from the Commonwealth of Kentucky, Mr. Yarmer. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I join you in welcoming our esteemed witnesses today, former CBO directors Dr. Rivlin and Dr. Holtz-Aiken. You have both played key roles in implementing the mission Congress set for CBO to be our independent, nonpartisan source of information and analysis. The truth is Congress simply could not function effectively without CBO's budget estimates and analyses. We make decisions that impact our entire economy and every family in America, and those decisions must be informed by sound data and evidence. We created CBO so we were not forced to rely on analysis from the executive branch or outside organizations, uh, information which reflected their own political agenda. We still need CBO to be that unbiased scorekeeper. <laughs> CBO does not make recommendations. They do not take into account politics or ideology. They deal in numbers and analysis only. The only agenda they have is maintaining their independent, respected voice, and I appreciate the hard work both of our witnesses have done in fulfilling that mission during their tenures as CBO directors. I'm also looking forward to the testimony of our second panelists, Maya McGinnis and Sandy Davis, who will provide viewpoints on CBO from outside the agency. The Committee for Responsible Federal Budget has a longstanding reputation for budgetary analysis and opinion. And I'm pleased to extend a welcome back of sorts to Mr. Davis, a former longtime CBO staffer, as the chairman mentioned. Sandy has a rare vantage point as an outside expert, having spent years on the inside. He is in the perfect position to, to discuss how seriously CBO staff take their responsibility to produce nonpartisan analysis and how they view the role of the institution they serve. Again, I thank our witnesses for coming, and I look forward to their testimony. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Yarmuth. In the interest of time, if any other members have opening statements, I'd like to ask for unanimous consent that members submit them for the record without objection. I would now like to welcome our first witness panel, consisting of Dr. Alice Rivlin and Dr. Douglas holtz aiken both former directors of the Congressional Budget Office. Dr. Rivlin and Dr. holtz aiken thank you for your time today. The committee's received your written statements. They'll be made part of the official record. You'll each have five minutes to deliver your oral remarks, and Dr. Rivlin, you go first. The floor is yours, and we welcome your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and uh, Ranking Member Yarmouth and uh, members of the committee. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, delighted you're holding this series of hearings, and uh, very pleased to present my views. Forty-three, <coughs> excuse me, 43 years ago, I had the good fortune to be chosen as the first director of CBO. It was a chance to launch a much needed congressional support agency and establish its structure and its initial traditions. My colleagues and I worked very hard with the then new budget committees to create a strong nonpartisan CBO and recruit talented, hardworking staff who would give the Congress the best budget estimates and analysis that we possibly could. My most important contribution, I think, to the nonpartisan credibility of CBO was insisting that CBO not make policy recommendations. We believed CBO should provide objective information and analysis. If asked, it would offer an array of policy options with estimates of what alternative policies would cost and what consequences they would likely have, especially for the federal budget but it would not presume to tell Congress what to do. Since then, the CBO has had a string of talented directors, one of them here uh, next to me, but I think the reason that the CBO is still performing at a high level after 43 years 
is that congressional leadership, and especially the budget committees, recognize their need for solid, unbiased budget estimates and have protected the CBO from partisan and special interest threats that could undermine its ability to do its job. No one needs to tell members of the Budget Committee that making budget decisions is extremely hard. Advocates of policy changes, including presidential administrations, are routinely optimistic, not surprisingly, about what their preferred policies will cost and what the consequences will be. Policymakers need to cut through the plethora of competing claims and turn to a neutral team of experts to answer questions like, what will it cost? What will the effects be? That's CBO jo CBO's job. To maintain its credibility and be maximally useful to policymakers, CBO needs to be as transparent as possible about the methods and models it uses to arrive at estimates and adjust its methods methodology in response to new information and estimating techniques. Critics of the CBO often appear to imagine that CBO has a vast storehouse of well-documented statistical models that can just be plugged in to generate estimates of costs and effects of any policy option that might interest the Congress. However, Congress often considers complex policies that have never been tried before and for which no models exist. CBO staff is often forced to reason by, by analogy from fragmentary data about vaguely similar programs tried under different circumstances and to estimate interactions among several policy changes that have not occurred before. Writing up these new methods and models in sufficient detail so that others can reproduce them is a time-consuming activity that competes with moving on to the next <coughs> set of estimates. Making these estimates is challenging, and the customers uh, need to have uh, a realistic uh, view of what can be done. More transparency requires more staff. One persistent dilemma which has confronted CBO directors since my day is responsibility creep. Although a few members of Congress <coughs> criticize CBO's performance, many others, and sometimes the same ones, are eager to have it take on more jobs for more clients. Drafters of the Budget Act back in 1974 recognized that CBO might become overloaded. If the budget committees want CBO to take on more responsibilities or respond to more requests, they should work with the CBO director and the appropriations committees to make sure that CBO has the resources to do additional work without reducing its quality. Though I'm delighted that the committee has devoted this series of hearings to oversight of the CBO, I want in closing to focus your attention on two far more important budget challenges. The dangers of a federal debt that's projected to rise faster than the economy can grow and the total breakdown of the budget process. The burden of the debt will weigh heavily on future taxpayers and it's on track to rise faster than even the optimists think our economy can grow. These derelictions of fiscal responsibility are not the subject of today's hearing, but they are the dangerous elephant in this budget committee room. I couldn't sit here in good conscience without drawing attention to them. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Rivlin, for your commentary. Dr. Holsaken. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Yarmuth, and members of the committee. Um, I'm quite proud of the years I spent as CBO director because of the organization I was privileged to lead, a highly professional uh, support agency dedicated to providing nonpartisan uh, analysis and, and, uh, and scores to, to the Congress. It was and remains a, a gem in uh, the, the federal agency world. Um, having said that, this is my first oversight hearing <laughs> because as director there were none. And I think that's not right. Uh, Every, every dollar of taxpayer money should have good oversight, and I think it's uh, a beneficial thing to have an annual oversight hearing for the Congressional Budget Office, if only, to echo what the Chairman said, to improve the understanding of what CBO actually does. It's a great forum for communication about 
current activities of CBO, but also for understanding of the methods they use, the staffing they choose, uh, the organization of, the, of the, the agency itself. It has remained a, a first-rate agency uh, for a number of reasons, and I want to point out two of the important ones. One, Alice Rivlin did a spectacular job of setting it up, and we all her, owe her a thanks for the, the tremendous groundwork that she laid in building a nonpartisan support agency. And the budget committees have served as fantastic curators of the CBO for over four decades, and I, I hope that they continue to do so. These hearings, I think, have uh, highlighted a couple of things that I'm going to touch on, and then I look forward to answering your questions. Uh, the first is this desire for greater transparency uh, on the part of many people uh, with respect to CBO. Here, I think it focuses on trying to better understand some of the scores that have been produced by CBO. And to my mind, there, there are two different views of what that transparency should look like. The one I would urge the Budget Committee to not pursue is the notion that somehow CBO merely needs to disclose every model and every uh, data point that it has ever touched in order to understand their scores. As, as Dr. Rivlin said, there isn't a statistical model for every piece of legislation that the Congress dreams up, and indeed, the most important ones are things that are new, for which there is very little guidance in either the research literature or, uh, and certainly not a formal model. Uh, I always remind people that I had to score terrorism risk insurance, the federal backstop, the private property and casualty insurance industry for an unknown terrorist attack at an unknown location using an unknown weapon. There is no model for, for terrorism risk insurance. Scoring is not modeling. Models inform your judgment, but scoring is ultimately a judgment exercise. So the kind of transparency that I would encourage is to focus on what is currently called the basis of estimate and better understand the nature of the judgments that the Congressional Budget Office had to make in delivering a score. Um, uh, it, it's just not modeling. Uh, the second thing about uh, the process that I think is poorly understood is it's not a forecasting process. Scoring is about ranking competing proposals in the correct order. Which ones demand more taxpayer resources and expend more taxpayer resources? What is a greater and smaller deficit? That's the, 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 the bulk of the scoring. If you wanted to have perfect forecasting, you would certainly not tie yourself to a March baseline when the economy may have changed dramatically by November when you're doing a score. You could update everything and, and just try to get the best forecast. Because of the nature of what CBO is doing, Forecasting is not its exercise. Scoring is there will be inevi inevitable trade-offs between ranking things consistently and doing the projections uh, as accurately as possible. That doesn't mean CBO doesn't try to, to get them as close as possible, but it's not really a forecasting exercise, and when it's characterized that way, I think it gets you off on the wrong foot. Last thing I'd mention would be the importance of communication. I think that uh, CBO communicating effectively the nature of the judgments it makes in its scores is an important thing for, for uh, CBO. I think it's also important for the Budget Committee and for Congress more generally to communicate to its members w what CBO does, what it is responsible for, the federal budget cost, and what it is not responsible for, measuring the benefits in a proposed piece of legislation. Uh, the better is the communication between CBO and the Congress, the better it will be able to fulfill its, its rightful role under the Budget Act and continue to be a first-rate support agency. But thank you for the chance to be here today. Happy to answer your questions. We appreciate uh, both of you, Dr. Rivlin and Dr. Holsaken, for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, the ranking member and I have conversed about our subject questions, and we're going to defer to the end of this particular panel the questions that we will have uh, out of deference to the members of our committee who have other things going on and other hearings perhaps to attend, and, and so we're going to go straight to, uh, to our members. So with that, uh, I'm going to yield to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Renacci or any questions he may have for our witnesses. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding the hearing. I want to thank the witnesses for your participation um, and your service to our country. I mean, again, uh, what you do is important. Uh, Dr. Holtz, you can, um, in your testimony, you mentioned that you are concerned the lack of communication between non-leadership members of the House of Representatives and mm -hmm. the CBO. I 100% agree with that. As a business guy, I'm always trying to find out where these scores are, are coming from. Um, do you have any recommendations for how rank and file members could have better communication with the CBO? Uh, if you read the written statement carefully, you'll find none, and that's because I didn't have a magic solution <laughs> to this problem. Uh, that, that, that's the truth. Um, I, I think it's an issue, right? Members on committees of jurisdiction have good access to CBO for the, the problems they're working on. 
members who are not, I, I think, uh, have a more difficult time. I would love to promise you blanket access, but CDO has a finite number of people and a finite amount of time and, and, and many demands on them. I think the, the sort of mission creep's a real issue. So to me, it seems that the best way to solve this is to identify the communication, you know, when is it that you needed information that you couldn't get it? And this committee is uniquely situated to ask CBO for information. And this is the best vehicle for having outreach, I think, to the rank and file, just to run it through the budget committee. Still makes it difficult, as you can imagine, for members uh, to make decisions, so. I, 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 I told you, it's not, it's not a silver bullet. It's I know, I understand, because it is, it, it is hard, I understand. You have a finite number of members and, uh, and uh, employees, and, uh, but you also mentioned in your testimony that CBO provides more information on the scores than it prov uh, that it provides. You would encourage the agency to focus on the desired structure and the basis of the estimate within the reports. Can you discuss more what you would recommend to provide more transparency? So, so I, I think that um, the, the basic structure makes sense. It, you get a score and it says, all right, here's the legislation, this is what it does. Um, here's the tables, tell you the budgetary impact. Now here's the basis of the estimate. How did we arrive at, at that set of numbers? To the extent that you read that and you don't find the information you want, it seems to me that it should be instructing CBO to say, we need to know in the basis of estimate, more things we care about. So for example, is this bill likely to require entirely new kinds of executive branch administration that will have lots of rulemaking and should we anticipate it? So when Dodd-Frank passes, should they flag the fact that this is gonna be an enormous regulatory uh, exercise? You know, what can you say about that? That might be something you wanna know. Um, what are the four key behavioral assumptions that go into you know, our judgment about how this, this works? Um, uh, they're, they're the perceived dissatisfaction with the, the scoring must mean that there are things people want to know that aren't in there right now. And I would encourage you to tell CBO what they are. Uh, Dr. Riddle, I'm gonna put you on a spot here a little bit. Um, do you think that the proper, over, you know, uh, what do you think the proper oversight role of the budget committee is over the Congressional Budget Office? And do you think the House and Senate committees have done an effective job to date of providing oversight? Well, I think you're doing it right now. Uh, this, this series of hearings was a good idea. Uh, I think it's brought out a lot of, of uh, information, uh, and I would encourage you to, uh, to do it again, uh, at least once a year, as uh, Doug said. Uh, but a formal hearing is not the only way to have oversight. I think uh, communication, I mean, if you don't understand something, ask a question, uh, and uh, I'm sure you know, a phone call uh, to Director Hall uh, or to someone he might direct you to uh, might answer the question. Uh, and uh, at least in my experience, and I'm sure in uh, Dr. Hall's um, a lot, I spent a lot of time communicating with members and their staffs uh, about what we were doing. And I certainly would encourage that. Uh, well, again, I wanna thank you both uh for coming today and participating. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Renacci. Let's go to uh, Mr. Kana, California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Holtzik, and uh, this White House uh, earlier described the CBO's assessment as, quote, little more than fake news. Uh, would uh, President George W. Bush or President George Herbert Walker Bush have ever referred to the CBO as little more than fake news? I'm not privileged to know what they thought, but they never said it. <laughs> what is your reaction to the president or the White House describing the agency as producing fake news and quote, uh, saying that it favors mandates over choice and competition, that its past predictions have not borne much resemblance to reality, you, are you personally insulted by uh, the White House given that this is an agency you led for a number of years? I'm not easily personally insulted, um, <laughs> largely because I led the agency for several years. Um, the CBO gets lots of criticism uh, because it's in the middle of important decisions and not everyone gets what they want. And that criticism has traditionally come from members of Congress, typically from the party of the director and they're disappointed in the director. That's the empirical regularity. 
the thing I found unprecedented was for an administration, a sitting OMB director, to uh, criticize the CBO in very, very harsh terms and to name in the public staff members at CBO and criticize them. I think that's uh, way over the line, unacceptable, and I told Mr. Mulvaney that in particular. I hope we don't see another repeat of it. Dr. Rivlin, maybe you could sh shed some historical perspective because I know when you were director, you know, President Reagan had disagreements, but it seems to me the tone of the disagreements were very different than the type of disagreements we see now, and it would be great to have your perspective on what those disagreements were and the tone of the conversation today. I am generally distressed by the tone of political discourse these days uh, uh, because it's become much more angry uh, and less polite and civil than it used to be. And I'm particularly distressed uh, by uh, a president who hasn't just named f the CBO fake news, it uh, appears to be anything he disagrees with. Uh, but that said, uh, let me uh, tell one story about the Reagan administration. When they first came in, they didn't understand who CBO was and who they worked for, and they uh, uh, immediately attacked. Uh, they, meaning the staff around the president, uh, not the president himself, and uh, said, we've got to get a new director. And the Congress immediately uh, reacted, and uh, uh, Senator Dole and Senator Domenici and a couple of others who were Republicans uh, called the White House and said, she works for us. She doesn't work for the White House. And uh, that was an inappropriate comment. And it ended right there. So a great point, Dr. Rivlin. It seems that your part of your point is that uh, the CBO strengthens Congress's role uh, compared to the yeah. executive branch and exactly. gives us a, a, a equal voice. I guess to either of you, what do you believe we could do quickly to help uh, make sure that the CBO doesn't face partisan attacks and uh, is something that is valued by both sides? I think it will always uh, face partisan attacks uh, because there will always be somebody who doesn't agree uh, with uh, the, uh, what the CBO is saying. Uh, the CBO is saying this bill will cost more than its advocates say or it won't uh, do as many beneficial things. Uh, so that's part of the, the furniture. Uh, I would just uh, ignore that and uh, keep supporting the CBO and using it and asking questions about the basis for its estimates. I, I would echo that. I think it's inevitable that those attacks occur, but they, they don't have to be the thing that people know about CBO. What they should know about CBO is the quality of its work and the ability it has to aid the Congress to make its decisions. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman. Let's go now to Mr. Arrington, Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for hosting uh, or chairing and presiding over these uh, oversight hearings. Um, I've found them as a new member to be very useful. Um, and I'd like to ask both of our panelists just um, a general um, question, uh, and that is, if you were the committee of one up here having the experience you have, wh what would be the one, two, or three things that you would change to make this process work better and to make sure that we had the most timely and accurate and partial information to do our jobs. Just a couple of things from, me, from each of you, please. Dr. Rivlin, you can start. Well, I would carefully examine whether CBO has enough staff to do the things you're asking them to do uh, and be sure that they do. That's not a specific recommendation, but it's uh, really important to recognize that uh, the, w their job is complicated and it takes quite a lot of people and they need enough people and good people. Uh, that would be my uh, major uh, recommendation. And then continue communicating about uh, how they do their work and how they can make it more useful to you. Mr. Holte. So when I was director, I, I <coughs> thought of CBO as a consulting firm whose client was the Congress. And as such a consulting firm, it was our job to provide them the information they needed to make the decisions that were, that were coming. And uh, if we could 
think ahead and, and identify the, the, the tough things that we have to do, we could get ready and, and um, uh, provide them with what they needed. There's a role for, for you in that as well, in providing the CDO with the game plan for what you intend to work on so that they can, in fact, um, do studies. We did many studies on immigration reform well in advance of, of the debates that ensued. We did studies of Social Security and, and uh, prescription drugs in advance of uh, efforts in, during my tenure to uh, do legislation there. Um, to the extent that you can convey to them the information they need so that they can be ready, that'd be fantastic. I think there's a, a real role for this committee in talking with the CBO about not only what will be in the score, but what would you like in the form of supplementary information. One of the pieces of, of mission drift, uh, as Dr. Rivlin described it, that has occurred over the years has been moving past just a table with budget numbers to something more about the policy and the effects of the policy, whether it's in health or, or tax or whatever, growth, number of people coverage, cost of premiums. There's, there's been a, a demand for more information. That's fair, but they should be given advance notice about the nature of the supplementary information that you would want, uh, the presentation of it, so that they can get it right, as opposed to doing their job and giving you a number, which is their job and they will do it, but having to, to have a lot less faith in, in the nature of that number because they haven't had time to prepare it carefully. You know, uh, I think you could reduce the criticism, and you'll always get it, and I think we can reduce the partisanship on both sides with respect to this <coughs> process where partisanship should be, quite frankly, eliminated to the extent you can. If, if, if there was a, a, a better record of timely and accurate information. So you talked about subjectivity and judgment. How do we get more empirical uh, information and analysis to bear in less judgment and less subjectivity? Um, and then how do we, you know, who is keeping the scorecard on how many times the information and analysis has been accurate and timely within a margin of error? I've asked that question. I haven't seen any scorecard. I don't know if you don't measure that, how we can make that judgment. And then you really get caught up in the sort of he said, she said sort of perspective and perception as opposed to what is real in terms of the performance of CBO. Some thoughts on, from both of you guys on that. I think that uh, Dr. Holsey can put his finger on it when he drew a distinction between scoring and predicting uh, or projecting. Uh, and uh, that's an important distinction to keep in mind. A score tells you, given everything else that we've assumed about the budget in the baseline, how will this particular piece of legislation affect the deficit uh, and other mag magnitudes uh, in, in the budget? Uh, and those kind of things can also be checked. I mean, for example, on the health, uh, the original uh, Affordable Care Act, uh, CBO overestimated the take-up rate, the number of people who would uh, pick up uh, this kind of insurance if, uh, if offered, uh, which meant they also overestimated the cost. Uh, now, that kind of thing means you need to readjust your model but to say um, they uh, made a mistake because the economy changed uh, or because Congress did something else that affected the budget, that is not a fair criticism of a score. Mr. Chairman, my time's expired. I'm sorry. Ms. Jackson Lee from Texas. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and to the ranking member, thank you for this hearing. And uh, thank you to Dr. Holtz Eakin and, of course, uh, Dr. Rivlin for their presence here this morning. I frankly believe that the Budget Committee is one of the most important committees in the Congress uh, because it is the uh, conductor, if you will, of the comings and goings of revenue and expenses uh, in what I hope would be an objective manner. And I really appreciate your honesty, uh, Dr. Holtz Eakin, and I assume it would be the same for Dr. Rivlin, that a toxic political atmosphere is not productive. Uh, for uh, assessing the needs of the American people. Uh, let me um, uh, proceed with uh, questions. I think we've talked about uh, that kind of toxicity. Um, I would um, want to pose the question generally of um, 
uh, tax cuts uh, and the question of revenue and the ability to uh, pay for the government. Uh, the recent, uh, uh, forgive me for my description, uh, tax um, scam, um, but the recent tax bill that was passed, um, so you'll answer it as a tax bill, um, was supposed to work towards investment by corporate America. All the economists have assessed that many corporations are using their tax relief uh, to do enormous amount of buybacks. Uh, so the question is whether or not it results in investment. So my question to you is um, how um, devastating uh, in the work that the CBO would do, uh, which is dealing with the comings and goings in many instances, as the Budget Committee may ask you questions of revenue and expenses, how difficult is it um, when it has to assess that on a growing debt and deficit? So I, I guess there are probably three different uh, pieces to my answer. Uh, piece number one would be the direct scoring of the bill is, is the, the domain of the Joint Committee on Taxation, and so issues about how it's scored um, initially should be taken there. The, the second place that would show up is CBO would have to and will have to uh, roll into its baseline estimates of, of the outlook for the economy, the impact of the Tax Cuts and Job Act and another legislation as passed. And so they'll have to make some evaluation of its impact on uh, the economy, both directly and through the, the larger debt that it would entail. And, and that I, they will uh, put out in, uh, in this month or early next month, I think. Uh, and then the third, I would say as an economist, you can't make that judgment on the basis of the initial buyback. Um, that gets a lot of attention, but that's actually the first transaction in money coming back into the United States. What matters is the final transaction. As you point out, what, what you want is to have that turn into genuine investment in fixed capital or uh, 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 intellectual property, some tangible intangible property right. that would raise productivity in the economy. You can't tell that from a buyback. The money goes back out into the financial system. Someone with investment opportunities can then use those funds to make investments the jury is out as to yet how much of that will happen. We'll have to find out. I think the jury is out. Could you follow up, um, Dr. Rivlin, by do tax cuts pay for themselves? You may want to follow up with that question. And then um, if the CBO office was cut by a half, as Republicans have wanted, does, is that helpful in its doing its comprehensive work? So tax cuts paying for itself and following up. Well, the tax, uh, this tax bill is a good illustration of a hard, how hard it is to uh, for the JCT, and it is the JCT, uh, to estimate uh, exactly what will happen as a result of a quite drastic and uh, unusually large uh, set, of, uh, set of cuts. Uh, I think history does not uh, support the people who think that uh, tax cuts pay for themselves. Uh, they may be conducive uh, to higher growth, but not so much higher that the tax cut pays uh, for itself, and I think almost all economists that I know are uh, agreed on that. Cutting the CBO staff in half uh, would make it uh, much less useful to the Congress, and I would urge you not to do that. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I yield back. I yield back some time. The lady yields back her time. <laughs> Mr. That, that's oh, noted, Mr. Chairman. I yield back some hey, time. <laughs> noted. Trust me. Noted. As somebody who gets to chair the proceedings in the House a lot, uh, very much noted. So, um, in fact, it caught me by surprise. Mr. McClintock, California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Rivlin, you say that um, uh, the Budget Committee really needs to focus on, on two much more important priorities, uh, the um, uh, staggering debt. Uh, as well as the uh, total breakdown of the budget process. Um, I tend to agree with you, although as far as a breakdown of the budget process, I look at the process that's laid out in law. It is very logical. Uh, uh, it is very thorough. Um, but there, to me, there are just two problems with it. Number one, there's no imperative to pass a budget, so we very seldom do because we can spend money just as easily. In fact, I think you can say we can spend money more easily without going through all of the fuss and bother of the budget process, so we simply ignore it. 
Um, what's your view of that uh, perspective? I think you ought to have a process, um, and this was the original intention in the 74 Act, uh, that forced the Congress to look at the whole budget right. uh, and to say, how much do we want to spend, not just this year, but right, over but the next few years? Right, but we don't have to because we can spend you with You don't have it. to. Uh, you should make yourselves have to. That's my uh, point is that perhaps the way to fix the budget process is to say you can't spend money until you've got a budget in place. Yes, and uh, there... Let, let me just add one other thing, and that is once the... Uh, another reason I think that the budget process is cast aside is that if we do go through all of the fuss and bother of adopting a budget, uh, the formal appropriations process uh, uh, is discharged out of the House uh, and then cannot be taken up in the Senate without 60 votes. Uh, uh, if you're in the minority, whichever party is in the minority, it's, it's much to your benefit simply to prevent the appropriations bills from coming up, uh, run us into a, uh, a deadline, uh, and then have a slapdash omnibus or, or continuing resolution instead. Is, is, is that also part of the root of the problem? There are a lot of problems, and I'm hopeful that this new select committee will uh, get into uh, ex exactly those kinds of questions. I don't want to opine on the rules of the Senate, uh, but uh, I think you need a simpler process that has a, that forces you to look at the budget as a whole first, and maybe make some rule like, uh, no budget, no pay, which no labels had uh, advocated, or no budget, well, no course, recess. The, 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 the problem uh, with that is that puts, to keep that people, puts members' personal interests ahead of their public duties, yeah. and that is always a uh, bad place to go. But, but, but again, uh, but you need to force yourselves to do it. Well, and again, I think the, 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 the simple way to force it to do it is say you can't spend money unless you have a budget in place. Yep. Uh, and uh, uh, the appropriations bills uh, are taken up on the Senate floor uh, by the same vote as the budget itself, majority, not, mm -hmm. not uh, uh, 60 votes just to take the bill up for right. consideration. Now let me turn to the other area where you say we are ignoring the, um, uh, a, a dire problem, and that is the ballooning deficit. Now we just passed a major tax reduction. I think it was absolutely essential uh, to move the economy forward, but it seems to me at the same time that places an added responsibility on Congress, if we are to do that, uh, then to, to uh, uh, restrain spending uh, and to go through the budget with a fine-tooth comb. Um, would you agree that, that having passed that, that's now our responsibility? We've got to restrain spending? Yes, but it depends what you mean by the budget. One of the, I would say you have to go through spending yes, and taxing. Uh, and the driving force uh, for the long-term increase in the debt uh, is not appropriations. Uh, which is what the budget process no, now again, deals I would, with. I would push it's, that. The, it's the entitlement, the mandatory spending, well, and, and the yeah. taxes. The, 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 the point, though, is it is spending in general. Whether it's discretionary or mandatory, once we've spent a dollar, we've already decided to tax it either now or in the future. The future tax is the debt. Uh, the debt and taxes are essentially the same thing, wouldn't you agree? The, the uh, a, a debt yeah. is simply a, a, well, a borrowing now so that we tax it in the future. If you decide to spend money, you've got to pay for it sometime. Exactly. Uh, but I think the problem with the budget process is it only deals with a third of the budget. Uh, you've got to get the mandatory spending in well, again, there. The, the budget and process the gives us a reconciliation process that allows us to adjust all of the mandatory statutes. We simply choose not to use it. Right. And you're not reviewing mandatory spending or tax expenditures. Right. Thank you. We have members coming and going, and I believe I am correct when I uh, suggest that the next round of questions goes to the gentleman from Virginia 7, Mr. Bratt. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you both for coming in. I taught uh, college economics for 20 years, and so I've been interested in some of the commentary here, and I'm sure you'll all be familiar with the literature between positive economics and normative economics. And I think that applies, right? Normative has to do with ethics. Positive has to do with your charter and goals. 
And so it's interesting, if you're going to do positive analysis on scoring and not forecasting, et cetera, I, I, I can buy that if you stick straight to the game. But then we always get into this political bias and the other side, even in, within these meetings, we got former heads of CBO weighing in on what are inappropriate comments. And have you ever heard these comments before? Those are normative claims coming from the head of a nonpartisan positive institutions. And so I studied economics and ethics for 20 years. That was my area, right? So I always find it fascinating. And that's part of what's wrong with this city. And so let me just kind of connect the dots, right? I, I, it, it's too complex to weigh in. I don't think there is a, a perfect point, but I think we're all engaged in normative activity. I can watch your heads nod yes and no when people put their political comments forward. And it, it's no surprise in academia, right? In Harvard, Yale, Princeton, the leading economic departments across the country, uh, it's predominantly Democrats, right? And they feed most economists, most economists working up here. And so I wish we had politically neutral uh, scores and bias and all that, but I don't think we do. I wish it was just even. So, and l let me just get at what I'm getting at a little bit. So if, if the CBO wants to weigh in, Tom McClintock was just making comments, we have 21 trillion in debt going to the kids, right? Intergenerational theft, uh, and there's gonna be a burden on them. And so when we do our scores and our explanations, I mean, it would be good to have an analysis of not just the gains that you get right now as a political party, right, for overspending, but the pain we're inflicting on the next generation. They have 100 trillion minimum unfunded liabilities. Medicare and Social Security are insolvent in 2034. If we continue to bust the budget, they don't get those programs. Where is that in the normative analysis and the score uh, when you're talking about budgets? These are fundamentally huge questions where we're stealing from the next generation. And up here, it's always just, no, we're going to be very precise. We're going to do a CBO score. It's very tight and narrow. And here's the impact on Obamacare, this, that, and the tax package doesn't pay for itself, and it has a deficit, et cetera. Very narrow little questions, but completely abstracted from reality and the pain it's going to cause. So I mean, maybe if you could just go shortly on that, and I want to ask one other question. Where is, uh, it seems to me you're, you are connected to the normative game, whether you like it or not. And as leaders in those institutions, you have to uh, not only score the narrow, but show the full implications of a policy into the 75-year or 50-year scenario as well. Dr. Rillen. I think CBO's done a very good job in focusing uh, the Congress's attention uh, periodically and insistently on the long-run implications of uh, current decision-making. They do uh, a long-run forecast. Uh, and uh, it, the numbers are scary. You're absolutely right. We are uh, inflicting a large burden on future taxpayers. Uh, CBO has been pretty good about that, uh, stressing that. Doctor? I guess I politely disagree with the notion that the CBO is not providing nonpartisan products. Um, I, I was the first CBO director to go from the White House to the CBO. There were people who flatly said I was a political hack there to ruin the place. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, I didn't make that. Okay. I, 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 I didn't I, I say it's, right, yeah. So, so I was every day conscious of the distinction between normative, what I thought was the right thing to do, and doing the job, which was answering the questions the Congress asked us right. in a way that was consistent with the research literature. Yep. So that, that's what we do. Yeah. You should ask them. If your concern is what programs will not be available in 2035, right. ask them, they'll tell you. And then everyone will know what's at stake. It's just that simple. Right. And, and, and that I'm, I'm kind of getting at, I mean, Dr. I agree with you, right? You've shown, good, good job, Siva, good run, showing on future taxpayers. But who are they? It is a political game up here. I think we need to define the actors a little more clearly as to who's winning and who's losing up here. The American people are fed up, right, from Bernie through Trump. Right, the, the election cycle made that very, they don't think the elites up here get it, what's going on in terms of the pain that's being inflicted. And so, and I'll just kind of uh, close on uh, adding to this a, a broader context. What do I got left? A few seconds, one. Uh, on the healthcare debate, for example, there's a question of. You gotta take a call <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the governor's got incoming. <laughs> There's a question again on, on the health care, on the narrow. How many people are going to lose their insurance versus who's going to get better or worse health care coverage? 
I don't think the analysis got into any of that. And so all we get from CBO on that is, you know, millions, this many million are going to lose their uh, coverage, but then nothing on, hey, the people that have coverage have $10,000 deductibles or $5,000 deductibles and can't see a doctor, et cetera. And if you keep federalizing every program up here, economic growth was going down, 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 as far as I could see. And now we're trying to crack it open. And so again, I mean, I know. Thank you, Chairman. All right, that's it. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. can I use the remainder of his time to answer that? I'll yield the gentleman a few seconds to respond, yes. Uh, this is the issue I was getting at when I suggested the committee should think hard about the nature of the supplementary information it wants. The CBO's job is to estimate the federal budget cost of legislation, period. It's the rest, which is part of the mission creep, that, it, that you're talking about. So if you're going to let the mission creep, provide some guidelines for how it's supposed to be executed. Mr. Brandt, you owe Ms. Jackson Lee a debt of gratitude for taking the rest of her time, by the way. Mr. Lewis, Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you to the panel. Oh, uh, I, I apologize. W would the gentleman yield for a minute? I, I forgot we have a, a newly arriving member of the other party that is here. Mr. Carver Hall, I'm going to recognize you from California. Sorry for the, uh, for the. It's okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ranking, ranking Member Yarmouth. Um, I'm a new member to Congress. This is my first term, so I'm going to call this for what it is. There's very few Democrats up here. So let's just call this what it is. It's a partisan hearing to try to discredit the CBO because recent scores about the Affordable Care Act did not yield the type of result that the majority party wanted. That's what this is. Let's just call it what it is. Certainly, if it would have yielded a different outcome, you wouldn't be here today. So since you are here, I will ask you a few questions. But let's just call this what it is. Um, what do you see as the biggest threats to the CBO's ability to fulfill its mission today? Well, I would differ with your characterization of this hearing. Uh, I've looked, I heard the, uh, I watched on C-SPAN the first one, uh, and uh, have uh, looked through the others, and uh, the, the, I don't think that uh, the committee has, in general, been out to get CBO. They've been trying to understand what CBO does and how they do it and how it can uh, be improved. Uh, that's the spirit uh, in which I would answer your question. Uh, the, uh, the partisanship uh, doesn't help. Uh, the Congress needs to understand the information and to ask as many questions as it can uh, so that it can understand what the consequences of various pieces of legislation, including the Affordable Care Act, are. Thank you, Dr. Riblin. Dr. Riblin, did you sign the letter of July 21st, uh, 2017, uh, letter from former CBO directors on the importance of the CBO's role in the legislative process? Uh, yes. Um, the, we, did, we did send a letter when we were concerned about uh, uh, the, the attacks on the CBO. So you no longer believe that these hearings are a, an attack on the CBO? I think there may be some members who want to attack the CBO, but I haven't had the feeling about these hearings uh, that, uh, that the whole series was an attack. But the letter you did sign did refer to concerns about uh, trying to undermine the nonpartisanship of the CBO, correct? I've always been concerned about that. I've been concerned about that for 43 years. Uh, we had a lot of partisanship in previous uh, uh, eras, and uh, I was always trying to preserve the, the nonpartisan role in the face of some partisan attacks. Well, thank you for stepping up, at least in this letter, expressing your concerns about the partisan attacks. Um, can you add to the question I asked, please? I would echo Dr. Rivlin on the importance of these hearings and, and the, the tenor that, with which they've been conducted. I'm, I'm pleased to be here today. As I said, it's my first oversight hearing. I think it's overdue. I think it's a great way to learn about what CBO does. 
and for CBO to learn about what, what genuine concerns are by, by Congress. That's a beneficial thing. I know about the letter. As I said earlier, my concern was not that there were partisan discontent with the CBO. That comes with the territory. Um, I was appointed by Republicans and they were more disappointed in me than, than were the Democrats. That, that, that's, that's the nature of the beast. I was concerned that the executive branch seemed to be trying to undercut the standing of the congressional support agency on which this committee and the remainder of Congress relies. That to me is unacceptable. You shouldn't let it happen. I wasn't going to let it happen. Thank you. Uh, you both have participated uh, with panels of economic advisors over the years. Do you think it represents a diverse, uh, diversity of views? Uh, absolutely. I've, I've both uh, uh, supervised those panel meetings. I've, I've been a member as a, a former director. Uh, there's a conscious, deliberate effort to turn over the membership, to represent new views of, of the performance of the macro economy, to bring in experts in new issues, such a uh, greater openness to global uh, capital flows, for example. Uh, and I think they've done a very good job of essentially running a shadow blue chip process whereby a consensus uh, forecast can arrive by consulting all parties. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, by the way, the letter he references, the 2017 letter, I just want the record to reflect that that letter was not uh, in any way or shape uh, related to the hearings that have been held uh, in 2018. Just wanted to make that clear um, uh, for purposes of, uh, of clarity. With that said, uh, let's go now to Minnesota. Mr. Lewis, thank you patiently for patiently waiting. A belated Minnesota. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. I, uh, I too, am a freshman here, and, and one of the things I've learned rather quickly, uh, especially on this committee, is that it seems we're in a situation where those who declare others being partisan are usually the most partisan. I'm having a really, really hard time trying to figure out how we invite the esteemed Dr. Rivlin to come as a witness when she was OMB under Bill Clinton. Is that right? You were a vociferous critic of Reaganomics. Is that fair? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's fair. Um, you've been a lifelong Democrat. I, I, I don't know where the partisanship comes in here. If we wanted this to be just a hit job, I would have thought we could find um, a different panel member, notwithstanding your, your fine credentials. I've followed you for many, many years. And I, and I will say this as well, that I'm old enough. I was a lot of fun before running water. I'm old enough to remember Reaganomics. I'm old enough to remember your role as the first Congressional Budget Office Director. And I'm old enough to remember the rather um, Blatant criticism coming from Larry Speaks and David Stockman and Jack Kemp and the president himself of the CBO at that time. So when I hear about the concern over the discourse today, I too have some concerns, but I'm also equally as distressed about people hiding behind calling others partisan when they're being immensely partisan. I mean, I presume, Dr. Rivlin, you're equally distressed as you are coming from this president in the White House. Uh, you're equally distressed by some of these resistance groups and what the activities they're undertaking today, right? Well, I consider myself actually, I am a Democrat, but I am a strong advocate of nonpartisan uh, analysis and, not, and bipartisan action. And I just hope we can get over this crisis of partisanship and have the two parties working together for the good of the country. And I, and I think we are on, on this panel, on this committee, but I just don't want to let this one-sided narrative go forward too far with the entire amount of blame headed towards one side of the aisle. Uh, we've got irresponsible rhetoric, irresponsible actions. We've got groups crashing congressional offices, sit-ins daily. We've got Antifa out there. We've got we've got people who w would be the first to criticize the CBO had they come out with um, some other scores, for, in for instance. I, uh, what I'm getting at here is, if you come out with 1.9% growth rate over the 10-year period, and in fact, the growth rate has already exceeded that. If you suggest that people buying health insurance on the uh, Affordable Care Act exchanges is, is 10 million overestimated, 
and someone says, you know what, there might be a problem with the growth model here. Maybe we need a little bit more dynamic scoring. Maybe tax cuts won't pay for themselves, but they usually get, garner more revenue than some of the critics admit. Uh, maybe that criticism has nothing to do with partisanship. Maybe it's exactly what we ought to be doing up here. Go ahead. Can I say a word about that? Yes. I, I, I think it's perfectly fine to disagree with CBO in the way you just described. I, Lord knows I disagreed with the staff when I was director, and I continue to at times believe they've come down on the wrong side of a question from the point of view of the research literature. I think it's a very different thing to take something that you disagree with and, and suggest that it's only because they have bad motives and they're not professional and try to undercut their credibility entirely. Those are two different things. The former is fine. It's been going on since the founding of the CBO. The latter flares up occasionally, but I think should be stopped as soon as possible. So, for instance, if you're passing a, a tax reform bill and the critics of the tax reform bill describe it as a sop to the rich, a uh, gift to your corporate donors, things like that, they're not describing ulterior motives in those critics? I'm saying it's from both sides of the aisle, some of this untoward criticism that you describe and I agree with. And I don't think, quite frankly, that we shine the light of disinfectant on one side quite as much as we should. That's all I'm saying. You're not hearing any of that kind of rhetoric from the CBO. No, that is true. And I'm not hearing it from you. Yeah. But I'm certainly, the White House is not the only origin of that sort of unfortunate rhetoric. And I think the other side needs to be held to that account as well. I think we could all agree that uh, there is partisanship on both sides. Yes. Thank um, you very much. I yield back. Mr. Johnson from Ohio. Well, there have been a number of responsibilities that CBO uh, was asked to undertake, um, and I'm not sure that I remember them all, uh, but some of them had to do with uh, impact on state and local government uh, was a uh, responsibility not uh, perceived at the beginning. Uh, and uh, at other times, uh, uh, environmental impact has been suggested as a, uh, a possible responsibility. Uh, I think the budget committees and the CBO together have been sensible in saying we'll stick to the budget impact uh, uh, of uh, legislation that, and because that's our primary mission. Okay. Um, Dr. Holt, taking if if CBO identifies an error in its scoring, what's the process for releasing a revised statement? Um, if, the, if the error is caught during the process of scoring legislation, mm -hmm. um, you'll communicate with the, the committee staff, typically, and the, and the members who are sponsoring the legislation about what you've discovered, let them know, and then you continue to score new pieces of legislation until they either pass or, or the so debate if, ends. So if, if the score has already been released and they discover an error, they communicate back to the, to the author yes. and then they release a revised statement if or a revised score. Is that correct? I, I'll be honest. I, I can't speak for the current CBO director and, and exactly what their procedures are right now, but it was not a common event. I had one instance where this happened, and that's what we did. Okay. All right. Um, for both of you, what, what suggestions do you have for both Congress and the CBO to improve communication and create a better working relationship between uh, Congress and CBO? Well, I would say just do it in the sense of uh, get, uh, uh, get in touch with the director, talk, talk to him, uh, ask questions, uh, and uh, and hold hearings like this one. Uh, but um, the main thing is just keep asking CBO, well, what was the basis for that estimate and, and uh, can you tell us a little more about it? I suggest you ask Sandy Davis on the next panel. Yes. Um, 
Absolutely, when good I, idea. When I became director, I, um, I, I came in a situation where the sitting um, uh, chairman of the budget committee had uh, uttered the phrase, CBO sucks, and I apologize for my language, that's a quote. That's a bad moment. And I interpreted that as there's very poor communication between CBO and the Hill for whatever reason. I got to talk if the budget committee feels that way. I asked Sandy to take on the job of making sure that there was never any surprise or miscommunication about what CBO was up to. You might not like what you heard, but you weren't going to be surprised to hear it, and you were going to understand where it came from. He did a spectacular job. So I don't think there's anyone who has worked longer at trying to improve this communication than him. And since I made him do all the work then, I'm going to make him do it now. Well, it's amazing what you can do when you when you communicate. Um, Dr. Holtz, uh, continuing with you, can you share some ideas on how CBO can make information such as underlying data and assumptions more widely available while recognizing the need to protect the agency's access to private data? Yeah, I, I think this is one where CBO really should be congratulated for the enormous advances in the past 15 years in what's available on the internet, what they put up on their website, the capacity to download spreadsheets that underlie the mandatory baseline, uh, um, the, the budget outlook, things like that. That, that. None of that was there. You could continue to do that and, um, and pursue it to every sort of, you know, digitize every written product they have so that the underlying data are there. I have zero problem with any of that. There, there are going to be things that you can't digitize and distribute. There are going to be proprietary data. There is some of that. And there are going to be assumptions. So in you know, scoring legislation, you're going to have to assume something about how the executive branch behaves. And there are no models for that. So that those judgments are the things they're going to have to write down. OK. All right. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Sanford from South Carolina. I uh, thank the chairman. Um, uh, I, I guess I'd begin with you, Dr. Holtz Eakin. Um, in 2015, you criticized the CBO for not having an official conflict of interest policy for panels on outside advisors. Say, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the beginning of that. I heard the buzzer. I said, in 2015, you criticized the CBO for not having an official conflict of interest policy for its panel of outside advisors. CBO responded. That your uh, to your criticism by saying that they were, they were developing a process uh, uh, in, in terms of dealing with this. Uh, I guess my question, since we've had much conversation on bias, um, was that policy ever developed? Uh, where do things stand on that now? Uh, to my knowledge, they've put in place a formal conflict of interest policy for their, they have panel of health advisors, panel of economic advisors. I, I guess I wouldn't characterize it as a criticism. I thought it would be wise to have one because it is easy to criticize them for a failure to do due diligence in the absence of one. So this just struck me as one of those oversights that had, had not happened over the years and that someone could fix it. Sure. Um, in today's political vernacular, that would be viewed as criticism, but uh, you can def define it however you'd like. Um, the, uh, you wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post last April on the subject of the President's tax reform proposal in which you state, quote, uh, sailing straight into a sovereign debt crisis is not pro-growth strategy. Um, do you think that we are sailing into a sovereign debt crisis? Yes. Um, based on? Uh, the trajectory uh, in any uh, forecast for the U.S. debt is rising levels of debt relative to GDP. That, that finding is not sensitive to either the growth or the budgetary assumptions. I mean, it's happening. We're not on a knife edge. We're headed uh, in an unsustainable direction. So the only question is when, not if. In that same vein, uh, Dr. Rivlin, uh, you in an interview with CNBC last May suggested that projections for sustained 3% economic growth, including the President's budget proposal, were, quote, very optimistic. Um, and you went on to furthermore say that 2% uh, was much more responsible. Um, if I was, it, since both of you all have alluded to this or commented directly on it, if you put the continuum of 3% growth out there uh, as crazy, impossible, improbable, unlikely, probable, likely, or going to happen, uh, where would you register yourself on the 3% continuum? Um, crazy and impossible or, yeah, could happen? Or, or, or just give me a probability. You'd say, if uh, pick odds between 1 and 100, you'd say odds are... 
I don't want to give you a number. I would say it's very optimistic, but let me tell you why I think that. No, no, I, I, just in the interest of time, I have two minutes. Give me a probability between one and 100. No, I can't do that. Okay. You have to, the, the, what it depends on. Let me skip on. To, your, to, to your coworker then. No, I understand a lot of what it depends on. What would you give me as odds, just as a betting man? I, again, I'm not going to, this is 10%. informal. 10%? 10%. Okay. I happen to agree with you. I think we're vastly uh, optimistic in terms of our economic forecast, but in the one minute and 45 seconds I have left, uh, there's been much talk of, of, of actually doing a budget versus a resolution, something less binding. Uh, if you were to say, got to have budget versus resolution okay, where would you be on that one? I think there should be a budget. I think there should be a single document where the House, the Senate, and the White House agree on what will be spent what will be raised in taxes and what will be borrowed. Until then, there isn't really a budget. That's not, you don't have a plan. You just have budgetary outcomes, and they're usually bad. Concur? I agree with that. Uh, last question. Um, in some ways, I, I, I empathize with you all. I mean, at, at times, um, do you feel like neutered academics in that, I mean, there have been study after study after study pointing to what you know uh, on, on the impossibility of us closing this funding gap, uh, whether it's on the entitlement side, we, which we've studied to death, there have been ultimately, I don't, can't remember how many different panels saying we got to do something, we got to do something, we can do not to do something. But, but, I mean, you've seen it over the years on the degree to which Congress will study that which it knows it has to deal with, that which you would assign a 10% probability to, and yet we continue to do nothing. And, and that's got to be at some level frustrating. Similarly, this idea of forecasting out whether it's 10 years or 75 years, that's a pretty tough thing in, in, in the world of economics. Any wisdom as to some of the frustrations you've developed either with studying things to death or being assigned the fairly difficult task of saying what's going to happen in 10 years? I'm more optimistic than <laughs> many people. Uh, in part because I'm a veteran of the last time the uh, Congress and the President together, it was very bipartisan, got a surplus in uh, the federal budget. Well, respectfully, and the Senate would say that was due to the tech bubble and the matter of no, revenue that came uh, as a consequence. Let me, let, me, let me just give you my view since I'm here. Uh, I think it was partly uh, good fortune, but it was very substantially the rules that the Congress imposed on itself in 1990. This was bipartisan. It was President Bush and the Democratic Congress decided on the Budget Enforcement Act and enforced them for more than a decade. And that held the growth of spending in check, including entitlements. Uh, and that was very important. And you need to do, it's harder now, but you need to do something like that again. Mr. Woodall of Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for uh, being here. I, Dr. Rivlin, I, I should have invited you to come by uh, my office. I'm glad we have uh, five minutes uh, together uh, today, but I hope uh, you will uh, come by and, and visit to. with me more. I, I want to go back to 1975. Uh, when, I, when I read the debate that Congress was involved in, in the, around the creating of the CBO, I get the idea that uh, we were creating an adjunct buddy, budget uh, committee staff. In fact, I get the impression that if the Senate hadn't insisted on uh, having its uh, own staff, that we wouldn't have even had a budget committee staff. We would have had two budget committees, both of which relied on the CBO to staff them. I can't imagine what it was like to try to build that organization up, but, but as I sit here today, uh, the CBO is the only staff director on Capitol Hill that comes and testifies in front of its committee to tell it, uh, tell the committee how it's going to be. It's the, uh, uh, Dr. Holtz Eakin just talked about uh, the, the breadth of information that CBO releases that's available out here today. There's no other committee staff on Capitol Hill that's running their own web page, releasing whatever information they decide is, is uh, pertinent to release. Back in 75, were you trying to set up a completely independent, uh, 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 almost uh, co-equal uh, committee uh, structure there, or were you trying to, to provide Congress with a counterbalance to, to OMB so that Article I wouldn't get pushed around by the, by the economists down at Article II? Dr. Riddle? We were trying to do what we thought the law uh, asked us to do, namely 
uh, create a nonpartisan source of information for the for the Congress and particularly for the budget process uh, that was its own, and so they didn't have to depend on the executive branch for estimates. That was the main objective. And so given that for the first time we were bringing together all of this intellectual uh, prowess, you know, if, if I call the, the uh, CBO director today, and I suspect it would be true in, in, uh, in, in Dr. Uh, Holtz-Aiken's era as well, and say, give me some good advice on how we can do things differently, the director today will say, well, Congressman, I'm not in the business of, of giving advice. If you want me to analyze something, I'll analyze it for you, but I won't give you advice. I can't imagine uh, when we were creating CBO in, in 74 and 75 that we were trying to create a structure that handicapped you from giving the members the very best advice that you could. Could you speak to that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I said in my testimony, I was the one who said we should not make res uh, recommendations. I think that was the right thing. Uh, that you need an agency which, which will give you analysis but not tell you what to do. And I have sat in rooms like this any number of times and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, uh, I can't answer that question. Uh, I can give you options and alternatives, but I can't say what you ought to do. And I think that's right. Now, given that the entire point of the exercise was to create a counterbalance to OMB, I'm certain that Director Mulvaney is not telling President Trump that he's unable to give him good advice and he, he can't make any recommendations. How are we as Article I advantaged by that, uh, that uh, mission statement that you laid out very early on? I have held both jobs. Uh, I've been in Mulvaney's position and uh, when President Clinton said, what do you think I ought to do? I had an answer. Uh, that's a different job. You're part of the President's cabinet. Uh, you give him the best information that you can, uh, but uh, there's no reason why the budget director can't give advice. The, and, and help me to understand why that's a different job. We, we created CBO to serve, to serve Congress in the same way that, that your uh, role was to serve President Clinton. How are we maximizing the expertise at CBO if we restrict CBO from giving its very best advice? Because you have both uh, Republicans and Democrats, <laughs> Clinton didn't. Uh, he, he was a partisan. Uh, and you have to, the, if the CBO is to maintain nonpartisan credibility in this intensely partisan atmosphere up here, uh, it has to refrain from uh, giving uh, advice on policy. And as you look at the CBO as it sits here today, does it look as you imagined it would uh, when you were setting it up in, in 75, or does it look substantially different? Uh, I think it looks as, I, as though, uh, as I hoped it would, although I don't remember what I hoped, uh, but I'm proud of the way it has developed. Dr. Rivlin, thank you very much. Dr. holtz -Egan, you have been very generous with your time uh, to, to various events that I have been involved in over the, uh, over the uh, years. My great hope was I was going to uh, uh, go back to the origins of CBO and solve many of my problems. Uh, Dr. Rivlin has disabused me of that notion uh, uh, today, so <laughs> I'll come back, to, come back to the starting point. Thank you both for being here, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Smucker, Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to both of you for being here. I um, appreciate the <coughs> uh, chairman scheduling uh, oversight uh, hearing in regards to CBO. appreciate the work that you have done to both establish and to maintain the effectiveness of CBO. I served in a state legislature where we did not, in Pennsylvania, where we did not have an equivalent uh, and formed an independent fiscal agency, nonpartisan independent fiscal agency, uh, to do exactly what CBO was intended to do. We, we had to rely too much on the executive uh, 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 projections uh, in the budget deliberation. So I, from my perspective, I think there's a really, really important role that CBO is filling and that should continue to fill. We can always talk about how to improve it, but I think it's, uh, uh, again, very important. You play a very, very important role. We appreciate what you've done uh, to, uh, to advance that. Um, do have a question on, uh, we talked about uh, some of the uh, frustrations, lack of communication that uh, some members feel. Do you think 
that the way CBO prioritizes is required to prioritize requests um, may uh, lead to some of that. So today we have you, you start, I believe, with leadership requests, then committee requests, and then if resources permit, you go with um, personal office requests. So I'd like to hear from either of you whether you think that is working. I, I, I believe it is. Um, CBO is oversubscribed, um, and, and that's the reality. So I'm, I know in my time it led to frustration by some members because they had a bill and it hadn't been scored yet, and I would get calls and have to explain. It, it said nothing about our desired relation with that member or about the legislation. It was the priorities the leadership and other committees had put on us. Do you agree with that, Dr. Riddle? Yes, I, I agree. I, there have to be some priorities, and uh, they are spelled out in, in the statute, uh, and uh, I think it, it, it is the job of the budget committees to, to help CBO enforce the priorities. Change subjects, Dr. Rivlin. Um, love to sometime talk more with you, uh, with uh, your experience. Happy uh, to. Ha having been here in uh, 1974, um, you know, I look back at that um, and understand that the intent was to create a process that works. Um, and uh, you know, as I look back over what we've done since then, it clearly isn't working, uh, at least in my view. Um, and uh, I'm interested in learning more about your comments in regards to the uh, Budget Act of 1990 and how that led to a balanced budget. But I've, I'm new, uh, first term. I've certainly come to conclusion that that the the process itself uh, is broken and and needs to be fixed. So I guess I'd like to hear your perspective, Dr. Uh, Rivlin. You've been here. You saw what was done in 1974. Do you think we need a complete overhaul? of the budget system, or do you think that we can just make incremental changes to what, uh, what we attempted with the Budget Control Act of 1974? I think you can build on some of the institutions that were created, including the budget committees. Uh, you don't need to rip it up entirely, start over, but you need to think about what are we trying to do here, uh, and how can we get a process that will lead us to a responsible uh, long-term federal budget. And I've uh, uh, written, uh, I, I worked with uh, the late Senator Domenici most recently on a proposal for a budget process reform. I'm happy to share that. Uh, but I think the main things are uh, that the, uh, uh, the, the president and both, house, uh, both chambers have to be involved in a decision about what the overall spending and taxing and debt is going to be. I, I agree with that. I have 45 seconds. What are some of the biggest uh, takeaways uh, that we can learn from 1990? Uh, from 1990? Right. Well, I think the, uh, the, the uh, Budget Enforcement Act of 1990, uh, which was what had the caps on discretionary spending, uh, those worked as long as they were enforced. Uh, and uh, the PAYGO process worked uh, to hold down increases in uh, mandatory spending. The problem now is that it isn't legislation that increases <coughs> mandatory spending primarily, it's demographics, uh, and that requires a different kind of uh, rulemaking uh, to uh, make sure that you have enough revenue to uh, pay for the long-term entitlements that you want. Thank you. I look forward to continuing that discussion with you. Mr. Ferguson of Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the ranking member as well. I'm going to start. I'd be remiss if I didn't push back on my colleague from California who's since left the hearing. But uh, I want to push back a little bit on the, on the shallow comments. Um, I think it says a lot about his love of opacity and his aversion to, to transparency. I think knowledge should be should be enthusiastically pursued in a hearing like this, and our goal should be to gain as much knowledge possible so that we can give CBO direction to give us and, and, and have confidence in those decisions so that we can make the best decisions for the future of America. And I and I have been you know I, I Dr. Rivlin, I, I share your your comments earlier, your, your perception earlier that uh, that these have been very much some some. Some good questions that have been asked and a real intent to, to get at a process that we all can have 
confidence in because as we go through time, both parties will be in the majority or minority at different times, and we want to have confidence in this process. So I was also um, <clears throat> interested in the comments that you made about separating out the, the analysis of the numbers versus the policy side of it. Um, I, I think that sounds good in theory, but I wonder how accurate that your, your long-term determinations would be if you don't take into account some of the changing behavior models as a result of the policy. Maybe I, maybe I was reading, reading your comments wrong because one of the, <clears throat> one, one of the concerns that I have is, is the accuracy of CBO scores at the 10-year mark. We're being asked to make huge decisions on information that we don't know what the accuracy is going to be in, at the 10-year mark. How would you, can you, can either one of you speak to how you would change the process so that we can have a, a better understanding of the accuracy of the projections at years seven, eight, nine, and 10 as we make our decisions? And, and, and if we can't get there, would it be a good idea for CBO to say at year seven, there's a 70% chance this will be right in year 10, there's a 50% chance that this will be right? And Dr. Rivlin, I'll let you take a stab at that one. Nobody can make projections for 10 years. Uh, and I, in my opinion, nobody's ever going to be able to make very accurate projections for the U.S. economy or pieces of it uh, for 10 years. There's always going to be great uncertainty. And uh, the CBO does convey that. Uh, it uh, uh, shows ranged bands of uncertainty around longer run uh, projections. But you and, need and a number. Yet, and yet, you and need yet a this number. body in Congress takes that CBO score as, as gospel. And we, that, and, and, and we, and, and we, we, bet the, we bet the form on that number no matter which way. Right. But that's, you have imposed that uh, on the CBO by making rules, rightly I think, rules for yourself uh, about the size of the budget deficit or the permissible increase. And then you, when you've got a bill, you've got to have a number which tells you, compare, compared to the baseline, what will this bill do to the deficit? And, and you can't stand a range. You have to have a number because it has to add up. Uh, and that's a very difficult problem. I don't think you can fix it. I think you just have to understand it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to concur. I mean, during my tenure, we put out this fan chart that showed the probabilities of being at different points in larger or smaller deficits, and members of the Congress asked us to get rid of it because they, they thought it made it look like we didn't know what we were talking about because we had a range, and they needed a number. So why give us all this extra stuff? Um, it's, it's the decisions the Congress has made. It's not, it's not CBO. That, so what, what you're saying is that we need to be honest with ourselves about this and not not blame not blame CBO you need a number yeah. and and CBO to this day when it writes things will will write things that convey more or less certainty in those if, they, if there's a great deal of uncertainty there'll be words like there's a great deal of uncertainty associated with this estimate you should then not be sure that the legislation solves the problem for 10 years you should be watching that okay you back all right, let's uh, now go to Ms. Black from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I certainly do appreciate um, you having these hearings because I think they've been very instructive and <coughs> informational. And I'm really uh, delighted to have both of you here today. Um, you've been two experts that we've turned to on a number of occasions. Um, and looking at uh, one of the biggest complaints that I've heard about CBO and the frustration for our members is the whole transparency piece. I know you talked a little bit about that earlier on um, because it is frustrating when you have an analysis and you get cost estimates and you get forecasts and you do look back and nobody is going to be able to give you that perfectly, but um, we do have to make decisions on those. And it is, um, I think, fair to say that in those instances where we believe in it, <laughs> an assumption has been made, especially in a behavioral assumption, where you uh, make an assumption that people are going to behave in a certain way. And I don't believe necessarily that what CBO puts out is the way people will behave because 
I've been around long enough to see something different about the way people behave. I think that's one of the hardest pieces for me to accept. And so what I want to get to is it would be nice for me when I get that from the CBO to be able to have that conversation, that dialogue. So perhaps I could even change the mind of the person who said this is the assumption they made. Is that possible to do with CBO where having a body where there's 435 members and um, uh, each of us uh, maybe having a disagreement with the way something has been analyzed, that we would have that ability to have the transparency, first of all, to see it, and second, then, to have that dialogue with whomever it is in CBO that may have put that information forward. Um, Dr. Rivlin, you want to start? Well, uh, ideally, I guess <laughs> it would be nice if you could do that. But you're also, you, you collectively are also saying to the CBO, we need a score, and we need it by Wednesday morning. Uh, and that precludes uh, having uh, a dialogue with 435 members. It's just not possible. So the best CBO can do is to say clearly, here's what we assumed, here's how we got this estimate, and they have been doing that. Uh, and then you can, uh, you can take it and question it, but there will be lots of uncertainty about who's right. And, and I may disagree just a little bit, is that we don't have an opportunity to, even in their assumptions, to be able to know where they got their assumptions from. That's not always transparent. And uh, I certainly would appreciate, for my sake, that that would be something that would be more transparent. So um, I, I think these are important issues. And the, mm -hmm. As I said in my written statement, transparency is a word lots of people use, particularly around CBO these days. And it can mean a lot of different things. I mean, there's. <coughs> What's the staffing of it? How much money does it get from the Congress? You know, the, the, those things should be knowable. There's what are the methods by which CBO does scores, and, and they, they put out descriptions of the steps involved in scoring. How do they uh, develop their scores? Then there's the question of a particular score. And at least for me, in the moment when you're, when you're trying to do all this stuff and the legislation's moving, you don't have time to write the best treatise on how all the different aspects of complex legislation. For my tenure, that piece of legislation was the prescription <coughs> Part D program, the prescription drug program for seniors. So we put out in the aftermath a detailed estimate of the prescription drug bill so that the Congress would know how we thought about it and that would give them the opportunity to come back and do exactly what you said, which is no. That, that's not quite right. And, and that's, so that's, a, I think, a necessary part of the communication to convey it and it took another 50 pages of, of a complete publication to get it done, but I thought that was important to document what had gone on in that, in that debate. I, I'll just give you a real quick example, and then I'm, I know I'm not going to have time, but I do want um, to leave this with you all. I would like to know, since CBO and the Budget Act has been around since the early 1970s, in your opinion, what does need to be done to update from where it was in 1974 when the original um, provision was put out there, but I'm going to ask you all to send that to us because I know I'm running out of time, but I'm going to just give you a real quick example. When one of my bills to defund Planned Parenthood, um, there was an estimate that came back from CBO that said that if Planned Parenthood were not um, there, that uh, women would not have an alternative source to have a birth control, and therefore X number of babies, uh, or X number of pregnancies would occur, and all of those babies would be m Medicaid eligible or they would go on Medicaid. And so the score on that was just astronomical. I don't believe that women are not smart enough that if one place closes down, you would go to another place to get a service, number one. And number two, I don't think that every baby that necessarily was born, if they didn't have a birth control from that particular agency, would necessarily go on Medicaid. So I'm just giving you an example of a frustration for me that I think um, uh, would have been better if I could have had a dialogue with the individuals that were giving that score. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Bergman, Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to both of you for being here. Um, you know, you've heard from quite a few of us freshmen, and uh, we all are a little bit of freshmen with experience in our own way, and mine happens to be federal service for 40 years in a Marine Corps uniform. and. Uh, all that means is I've seen a lot of different things over a lot of different decades, but I've been keeping notes here on some of the commonality of terms. Um, when I heard mission creep earlier, uh, that's, a, that's a term applied to the Department <laughs> of Defense. 
uh, I heard something to do with our role. I would just add it from the military side, roles and missions. You hear that term a lot when it comes to uh, the military doing what it needs to do. I heard the term quality advice. Um, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, through the Joint, you know, with, in conjunction with the Joint Chiefs and the Secretary of Defense, give that <coughs> best military advice to the President on what they should do in matters of defense. Um, now I'm going to add a couple here. In military terms, we've got the fog of war. I would suggest you have the fog of scoring because of the fact that when you, no matter how quickly you plan or how long you plan, you're going to go into a period where when it really starts to hit the fan and that you were actually um, enacting policy, enacting legislation uh, based on a score, there's going to be a fog period, foggy period that we don't know, hence the, the challenges in predicting to the 10-year window. Um, why I draw the, the parallel with the military is um, right now I think and everybody in this room would arguably agree uh, the confidence in the United States military to actually carry out its missions because we have now, for the first time in a long time, taken a force that's been stressed for a period of a decade and continually at some level of conflict. Um, we have a military that is held in high esteem throughout the United States because of the fact it actually gets its, you know, it does its job, it, do it completes its mission. Um, it's not perfect because the fog of war. So that credibility that the United States military has is, is highly you know, rated uh, amongst all of us here in the country. So uh, Dr. Rivlin, you have said, quote, undermining the credibility of the CBO when policymakers need it most harms not only Congress's ability to do its job, but also the long-term effectiveness of political parties in addressing the challenges that face our country's future, end quote. So using that, that idea of credibility, what should this budget committee do to support the CE, uh, CBO's mission while we conduct our oversight? Give me some points, if you would, please. I think you're doing it. Uh, it, in this series of hearings and in continuing to ask the CBO uh, for information about its methods and how it arrives at estimates uh, and uh, listening to their answers. You, uh, I think that is the, the primary thing that you can do um, and then not to imagine that uh, the CBO is going to be perfect um, but uh, to use what information they can give you and then get along, get on with budgeting, which is after all your okay, job. Okay, so then I'd like, and that's, thank you, because I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that you use those terms. Because one of the things that I believe we, as a, an oversight committee, but also as a Congress, one of our challenges is to have the Monday morning quarterbacking going on within the media at, at halftime. And in other words, comparing the CBO score to what we proposed and all the back and forth of that, we're not at the end game yet. So the question is, how do we, as the, uh, you as the CBO, I guess, maybe uh, review your, your game films, if you will, or your mission in such a way that when, when what you say is misinterpreted or taken to an nth degree, as opposed to the reality of the uncertainty, in other words, it's gray, not black and white, how then do you convince the, uh, those, the American public and the Congress that, hey, we got this right, but we didn't get that right, and we're gonna move forward, and, and again, in the military, not, not let that happen to us twice. And I see I'm out of time, but um, you know, if you wanna reply to that uh, well, in five I seconds. I think you said it well, uh, and I think CBO tries to do that to say when they didn't get something right uh, and how they're revising their next estimate in light of that. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, the ranking member, Mr. Yarmouth from Kentucky. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you both for your testimony. I think it's been very helpful today and, and uh, kind of um, 
puts a finishing touch to a certain extent on a, a very productive series of hearings. Uh, I don't want you to um, uh, infer that the lack of um, my Democratic colleagues' attendance today indicates a lack of interest. I think many of them were up half the night watching what was going on in Pennsylvania. And, um, <laughs> but uh, we've had better participation in, in other hearings. You know, we, uh, I'm very honored to serve on this joint committee with, um, led by our chairman, Mr. Womack, and also with uh, Mr. Woodall and others. And one of the things that I know is, uh, well, it may not be a prevailing attitude among the, the group there, but it certainly uh, has been expressed by some, is that what we have in our uh, broken bu bu budget process is not a structural or procedural issue as so much as a human issue. And clearly, I think there's a lot of validity to that. But, and the human issue also implies a lot of a, a political element as well. But it seemed to me that there are probably some things that we might be able to do to kind of um, affect the human element of our, the human aspect of the budget problems. One of them, and I'm going to throw it out and ask for a response, and went in a side discussion, I talked to the chairman about this, that one of the things that seems to have corresponded roughly to a, a breakdown over the last decade or so in the budget process, uh, seems to correlate with the, when we ended earmarks. And ending earmarks, I think, took a, away a lot of the, um, the motivating aspects of getting a budget done and doing it seriously. Do either of you have an opinion on the, the, uh, the issue of earmarks in a budget process? I think the <laughs> earmarks were a useful tool in a negotiation. And here I'm not speaking as a former CBO director because the CBO wasn't involved in this really at all. Uh, but uh, when I was uh, budget director, uh, certainly uh, there were a, a lot of times when uh, the administration wanted to get something through, like our budget uh, uh, reduction package, and it was important to have a courthouse or uh, something else to offer uh, uh, to round up the votes. So, so I, I, I concur with everything I know. I wasn't in that, that job, and I've, I've not done those negotiations, but everyone says they are important. For the budget committee, I think the issue is Will the budget reflect that, that earmark in a transparent fashion? I have, if something's in a bill and it's voted for on the floor of the House and then the floor of the Senate and signed by the President, I don't view that as an earmark. That's now a matter of national public policy, and, and there's no problem with that. Um, so I think you need to sort of just make sure that the in the dead of night phone call earmark doesn't come back. That's not good budgeting. Uh, the rest, think about. Okay. Uh, you know, we, we talk a lot of, and we've had discussions about this for years and years and years, the, the problem of long-term forecasting and long-term budgeting. And in many cases, in the budget process, we have gotten around, and in the appropriations, pro pro well, the legislative pro process as well, we've gotten around it by certain gimmicks. For instance, in the tax uh, law, we let the tax cuts expire after a certain number of years so they could get under the limit, uh, the $1.5 trillion uh, debt limit of the bill. and. We've done gimmicks on both sides, uh, you know, putting it for on the revenue side, saying we're going to sell oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, and you know, that's how we actually make course, uh, we comply with PAYGO rules. And, I, and I'm wondering whether, because we do things that are, I would say, somewhat at least disingenuous, if not dishonest, when we do some of this, and, and Dr. Ribbon, I think you're the first person who's actually mentioned the word pay-go in all of these series of hearings, and uh, you, you, you favor it, but are there downsides to the pay-go rule, pay rule in the sense that they may encourage the kind of gimmickry that uh, we see too often? Well, I think <laughs> there'll always be gimmickry, uh, but you do need rules and you need to take them seriously. And the PAYGO rule uh, in the uh, Budget Enforcement Act of 1990 uh, was a very useful tool 
uh, for keeping both the Congress and the administration from proposing uh, either tax cuts or big entitlement increases that weren't paid for, that increased the long-term deficit. I have sat in the Oval Office and said to President Clinton, you, you can't do prescription drugs. We couldn't pay for it. Uh, now, President Bush eventually did. Uh, but as long as the PAYGO rules were in force, they, they held down long-run spending and, uh, and tax cuts as well. And, and I know this, oh, sure, Just Doctor, I'm sorry. One observation on PAYGO rules, which is uh, that PAYGO is good for stopping the problem from getting worse, but it doesn't ever fix the problem. Right. We are now at a point where you need to fix the problem. Yeah. And so something different than PAYGO is going to be needed. Yeah. Thank you. And this obviously doesn't have much to do with CBO, but it does have to do with our budget process. And, and Dr. Rivlin, you again, as OMB, you would have dealt with this. And I, the question is timing. Um, we begin the budget process, at least in the House, it seems to me, and I've been on the committee for 10 years now, we generally begin it in March. And we expect that process to finish very quickly so that the appropriations committees can do their work. Last year, I think, former Chairman Black, we fi finally did our budget work in July, which basically made it th the idea that we were going to get any kind of action out of the Senate and coordinated was, point it was, well, it was a mood issue. My question is, and you know, we obviously we wait for the presidential budget to come out, and that's this year that was late because, or last year was late because of the first year of the administration. My question is, would it make any sense from your perspective that we actually started the budget process at the beginning of the fiscal year instead of waiting till February or March? Because we all know what happens around here in January and February, and we work very few days, and we have State of the Union, and we have retreats, and all of those things. Uh, does that make any sense to you? Every other year, it'll be a different Congress. That's the that's the uh, the main problem, I think. I mean, starting sooner is always a good thing, so you're ready to to go in January. But the important thing, if you're going to ha take the budget process seriously, is to get the budget resolution done early, so that you can then proceed to appropriations. Well, I'm going to yield back my time because you've been very generous with your. Oh, Doctor, I'll take it. I guess th th this goes back to some things we've talked about earlier in this hearing, which is one of the things that is in the gap between the president's budget and the budget resolution work is CBO's rescoring of the president's budget, their look at it. And that has now, uh, over time, taken on greater and greater dimensions, including a macroeconomic analysis of the president's budget, started under my tenure. So if you want to speed things up, you are going to have to think about the scope of what you ask in order to get everything done. Thank you very much. I'll yield back, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, uh, we're, we're almost at the conclusion of this particular panel. I got a couple of questions I want to ask. You know, Dr. Rivlin, at the end of your testimony this morning, you made some comments uh, about the debt, uh, which I truly appreciated uh, uh, your thoughts on it. Uh, to me, it's a fascinating topic. Um, you know, we had our behavior modeling uh, hearing with CBO recently. Uh, the one thing that I, I guess we're not really good at modeling uh, is uh, the politics of, of an issue. And in this particular case, the fact that we all know, if we have an honest conversation with ourselves, that the issue is not what we appropriate. It's not the, uh, the discretionary spending of the federal government. That piece is getting smaller and smaller every year. The downward pressure is coming from the mandatory side. And uh, we just aren't able to have that political discussion satisfactory to render a uh, decision. I've always been uh, amazed at how many people say, yeah, we, we just need to take politics out of some of these issues. Take politics out of a political process, which is all but impossible. Um, but a fascinating topic is, to me, it seems that the only real way to constrain Congress on matters of spending to the extent that we see them today and moving on a trajectory that is terribly unsustainable is that to enshrine into the Constitution the notion that Congress shall not spend more than it brings in. 
your thoughts. The, tr the trouble with a balanced budget requirement uh, year by year is that it would be very counterproductive at certain moments when the economy was in recession, for example, or when you had to go to war suddenly. Uh, you don't want that. And to write a requirement with a lot of exceptions, my late friend Charlie Schultz used to say, uh, by the time you're through, you're writing algebra into the Constitution. And that's the basic problem. Uh, I think the only solution is not a uh, balanced budget amendment, but sitting down together, as we did in the Simpson-Bowles Commission, Republicans and Democrats, uh, and, and going through the numbers and saying, how do we bring these two lines, the rising spending line and the static uh, tax line, uh, together? It's got to be, you got to think about both sides, uh, not just the spending. Uh, but uh, reasonable people can do that. We had very good discussions in Simpson Bowles. We came up with a pretty good plan. Will, will it require caps on, on spending, mandatory spending as an example? Yeah, you could, and uh, I think that actually would be a good idea for the Congress to, to, f to have a plan, what do we want uh, mandatory spending to look like, and then review it every once in a while to see whether you're off track, decide what to do. But it still comes back to the political problem that you'll have different views about spending and taxing, and you've got to resolve them. Dr. Holsey, can we, uh, the, the select committee that uh, Mr. Yarmouth referenced is going to undertake a process that we hope, realizing hope is never a method, but hope that will yield a result that will be good for our country and good for the process. Um, is, um, is biennial budgeting uh, an outcome that we should seriously take a look at? You won't have to because it's effectively what's going on right now. Um, typically a budget resolution isn't passed during election years and you're doing biennial budgeting. So if you're going to do biennial budgeting, think about how to do it well. And um, you know, I, I thank both you, Mr. Chairman, and, and you, Mr. Yarmouth, for, for leading this effort. This is uh, something that I think is very important at this point in time. To my eye, there are two distinct problems that, that stand out. One is the appropriations process and the, the sort of shutting of the government uh, brinksmanship and, and how do you get the approach process back to what was originally intended. And the second is entitlement spending. And um, I don't think it makes sense to try to rework the entire budget process, build on institutions as Dr. Rivlin recommended, but focus on those as the two things where you have to make it better politics to get the appropriations done and to get entitlement spending on a sustainable track. That, that, that's, the, the, that's really it. You made a comment a minute ago about PAYGO and the tweak to the 74 process. Um, I, I kind of label it or categorize it as uh, giving first aid to, uh, to a process when the, the patient really needs some major surgery. I, I think we're now at that stage where we may not have a terminal case, although the glide path demonstrates otherwise, mm -hmm. but uh, we, we, don't, we don't need a Band-Aid anymore. We don't need first aid. We need some kind of major circumstance, do we not? The outcomes have to be dramatically better. What, you're, you're a better judge of what changes in the process will do that. Um, every CBO director has hidden behind Rudy Penner's priceless phrase, which is the problem is not the process, the problem is the problem. And the problem is now here. It's not a long-term budget problem. It's large and it's extraordinarily consequential for the American future. Uh, what process gets that addressed is really hard to say, but, but we have to do something different. Dr. Rivlin, a comment? Uh, I, I agree, and I think the, uh, the main thing is to sit down and say, what is the problem? The problem is rising debt. What are the things we can do about it? Uh, and you know what those are, and I submit that there have been, we're doing a lot of spending through the tax code as well as uh, direct spending, and how do we bring those two lines together? Uh, those are political questions, but they are, if, if the two sides have the will to solve the problem, you can do it. Very good. I'm going to yield uh, the balance of my time for purposes of this panel 
Um, and, uh, and I'd like to yield to a couple of members who are late arrivals that were here earlier and had to go for other reasons. Mr. Grothman of Wisconsin, I'll, uh, I'll recognize you first. First of all, we're honored to have you folks here. I never thought when I was uh, 20 years ago that someday I'd get to ask Alice Rivlin a question, so I'm very honored. Um, you just brought up something that was kind of interesting. You're right, we do a lot of spending on the tax code. Um, do you think, and of course that spending as a practical matter becomes mandatory spending, correct? Yeah. Do you think that that mandatory spending through the tax code should be reclassified as discretionary spending? I think it <laughs> should be the object of periodic congressional scrutiny, whatever you call it. Uh, and that goes for the mandatory spending uh, for on entitlement programs. You gotta take a look at this every once in a while and say, is it too big? Well, I, I guess it's obviously too big. Uh, and I can argue that we'd be better with mandatory spending and better with uh, discretionary spending. Um, I'll ask you that question. I mean, there's a feeling around here that we ought to have to vote on mandatory spending all the time, but at least hypothetically, if, if one party has both houses, we can do something about mandatory spending. We can't touch discretionary spending, correct? Well, uh, you do uh, touch discretionary but spending. We can't, but in this regard, I'll say. It it's seems to me that as a practical matter with discretionary spending, which is going through the roof in this year, we have an informal agreement that military and non-military spending will go up and down together. So as what's happening right now, um, a group of a group of Republicans, I believe, demanded a big increase in defense spending, and because they got a big increase in, def and you couldn't get a big increase in defense spending without a big, big increase in non-defense spending as well. Um, do you believe that's accurate, and do you believe that's a problem? I th <laughs> no, I don't want to make a judgment on that. I think that you did, uh, there was a strong reason for uh, increasing the military spending. I think there's strong reason for uh, not cutting any more and probably increasing domestic spending as well. But that's just a, a my own uh, judgment. Uh, the basic problem is not the long-term increase in discretionary spending. If you want to do something about the rising debt, that discretionary spending isn't going to help you. See, and here I idolized you. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll ask, because see, that, that's why this budget is bad, because there, there are people have drilled into people around here that discretionary spending doesn't count, so we're borrowing 20% of our money, and we're, we're increasing discretionary spending by 10% this year, because mandatory spending is more important. Uh, like, it doesn't matter that we're increasing discretionary spending by 10%. Do you want, do you want to comment on that, um, doctor? I, I will um, also avoid drawing judgment on the, the nature of the political deal that was cut, whatever that might be. Um, I, I think from a budget committee perspective, this, there are several lessons here. Uh, lesson number one is that there, the currently discretionary and, and mandatory spending are on unequal footing. And if you really believe a dollar is a dollar and that equal policy uh, opportunities should be weighed on a level playing field, you have to address that. You have to change that in some way. Um, if that dollar is uh, a refundable tax credit and is really just spending, it, uh, in my view, it should be labeled as mandatory spending, brought over to that side, and, and show the, the real picture for the resources that are, that are going out. So leveling that budgetary playing field and identifying everything on, ev on an even keel, I think, is, is, the, is the objective. Um, the second thing is, there's a very uneven review process every year for discretionary in principle and n almost never for mandatory. So you, you need to fix that. You, you, you have to, to get the mandatory programs regularly reviewed, if not every year. And the third is caps, however desirable they might be from making the budgetary outlook look better, aren't a policy. They're saying independent of what our policy objectives might be, this is how much we're gonna spend. That doesn't make a lot of sense 
So in situations where you develop a policy, and that's what the president's budget is supposed to do, you have a national defense strategy and you fund it, you now know what it costs for that policy. You can have the discussion on whether that's the policy this nation wants. And, and that's, caps take that away, and, and that's not helpful. Okay, I'll yield the remainder of my time if I have more time. Mr. Palmer, Alabama. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Rivlin, glad to see you. Um, in 2014, uh, you gave testimony in front of the House Committee on Financial Services, and you said the following, that uh, the right policy to address the debt would be to slow the growth of the health care entitlements, get Social Security in long, into long-run balance, reform the tax system to produce more revenue by broadening the base and lowering the rates, and cap the growth of discretionary spending. Do you still believe those four principles are key to addressing and eventually lowering the debt? Yes. I think, uh, to, you know, just for the record, that's what we've been trying to do for the last year. Uh, I, I will say, though, on the discretionary side, we're not doing very well. Uh, uh, Dr. holtz uh, good to see you. Good to see you. I've um, been working on, on the regulatory side of things and uh, we've seen estimates as high as $1.9 trillion in terms of what overregulation is costing the economy. In the last 18 months, uh, we've done quite a bit to reduce, get rid of the obsolete, the redundant, uh, the contradic contradictory regulations. Uh, has anyone taken a look at how uh, regulatory reform impacts economic growth and, and, and and given any projections on how it will impact um, federal revenue? Uh, I, I haven't seen those estimates. Um, I, I would concur that there's been an enormous change in the regulatory burden and the growth of the regulatory, regulatory burden in particular. I, I have to believe that directionally it's going to improve the, the overall performance of the macro economy, but uh, that, that's an area where the research literature provides very little guidance as to the actual magnitudes. Um, is there any way to, to include that in estimates for the impact on the economy and, on, and particularly on, on revenue? Are we just going to have to learn by doing or? Uh, um, I, I believe there are ways. Um, I've thought about this problem a lot. There are, there are none that are easy and that are to the sort of degree of maturity that you could just like between now and a month from now, have some estimates of the impact. Um, well, there's before, a lot of work that needs to be done. Before I had to run out, you, I, I, I tried to jot down what you said, but you, you said something about mission creep for CBO and, and certain things being outside their ability to project. One of my frustrations has been the CBO's projections on the benefit of, of repealing the, the ban on exporting crude oil. Uh, their projections for, uh, in terms of revenue um, generation have been, I think, uh, incredibly low is are those type things including the estimates on on the impact of regulatory reform are, are those outside the ability of the CBO well, CBO certainly has no portfolio on regulatory uh, mm -hmm. issues that that's one that's been suggested in the past and um, I, I've always been concerned about that I mean that that's an enormous undertaking CBO certainly could not undertake it with its current staffing and I've always been worried that you would turn a, uh, a premier budget shop into a less than premier budget plus regulatory shop, and that would be a step in the wrong direction. Get, have a good regulatory analysis shop if that's what the Congress mm -hmm. needs. Well, my point on this is, is that in trying to deal with the deficit and the debt, is it's not just reducing spending, it's increasing revenues. And, um, and, and I've, I try not to be too hard on the CBO because I've, in my years with the think tank, uh, worked with the CBO on, on other things. But there's got to be um, better information, in my opinion, that comes out that, that takes into account these improvements in the economy, because we've, we've, we've got to do this with revenue growth and with spending cuts. In that regard, Dr. Rivlin, I, I want to go back to something you said earlier about the way the CBO assumes growth when it creates its baseline, evaluates changes to programs and, and incentives, incentivizes further spending. Even when a program spends um, more than it did in the previous year, any change to that program results in that results in less spending. Then the CBO projects that it's that it's a cut. 
And I don't quite understand that because, for instance, on Medicaid expansion, uh, when we, in our bill that we passed last year, froze Medicaid expansion, uh, everybody's running around saying we're cutting Medicaid, which, frankly, that, oh, that's not a cut. Uh, when we were talking about uh, requiring able-bodied adults without dependent children uh, to work, uh, they're real, and that's a cut. That's not a cut. W would you comment on that? Yes. Uh, this has been a, a controversy over terminology for a long time, uh, but I would submit you do need a baseline. You do need to ask the question, if we make this change, how will it change what the, the budget from what would otherwise have happened. Now you can find another word for than cut, but you do need to know what the impact on the budget of changing a law is and compared to what would otherwise have happened under existing law. Uh, that, that's just a useful thing to know. Uh, and uh, you can change the terminology, but you need to know that. If the Chairman will indulge me just for a minute. M on that point, I, I, you're, I agree with where you're going with that, but I think the key is, is that if we're spending, we, we're obligated to spend a certain amount of money and we don't spend that, that's a cut. But if it's an open-ended deal where it depends on how many people sign up, I don't think that's a cut. And I think, uh, uh, Dr. Holtzikin, if you'd respond and I'll yield back. So All right. you need a baseline. And the method by which the baseline is created, the, the rules that are followed in, in doing that projection, are laid out in the Budget Act. And the CBO, in consultation with the budget committees, and f fulfills his mandate to prepare the baseline. If you don't like the, the appearance, what you're really saying is, I don't like that baseline. And you ought to think about looking at the Budget Act and deciding if there's a better baseline preparation. Dr. Rivlin, Dr. Holsekin, thank you so much for your testimony today. I want to advise members, they have, uh, if you want to submit written questions for the record to be answered later in writing, uh, please do so. Um, they'll be made part of the formal hearing. Any members who wish to submit questions or extraneous material for the record may do so within seven days. That concludes this part of the hearing. Uh, the chair is going to uh, declare the committee in a recess for a period of about five minutes so that we can switch out our witnesses and also provide for an opportunity for members like myself to enjoy a comfort break for uh, just a moment. And uh, we'll reconvene with our second panel here in five minutes. Okay, now you guys gotta clean it all up. <laughs>
Once again, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, House Budget Committee hearing is uh, back in session. And we welcome our second panel. And uh, on this panel, we have Maya McGinnis, President of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, and Sandy Davis, Senior Advisor at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Ms. McGinnis and Mr. Davis, thank you for your time today. The committee's received your written statements. They'll be made part of the formal hearing record. You each will have five minutes to deliver your oral remarks. And Ms. McGinnis, we're going to give the floor to you. You have five minutes, and uh, the time is yours. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for uh, having me, and thank you for sticking around, because that was a panel that covered a whole lot of really good details, and I'm afraid I won't have much to add that, that contributes more than they were able to. Um, though I do have an interesting perspective of also being a consumer of what CBO sets out, so that's useful. Um, but thank you for holding these hearings. Um, I think that they have turned out to be very value add. We've gotten a lot, we've learned a lot from them. Um, and also thanks for inviting me to come before the Budget Committee, which is my favorite committee, um, and to talk about CBO, which I think is really invaluable. Um, both because the mission that it has of being an independent body producing impartial numbers is so important, and because of the quality of its work. So having an independent, non-political referee producing impartial numbers um, is certainly invaluable in that it allows us to know the costs of policies, adjust them accordingly, figure out appropriate pay-fors. The fact that CBO takes no positions, as Alice, Alice Rivlin was talking about, helps to provide the quantitative analysis that then lawmakers can use as they see fit. So if we were living in an ideal policy-making world, the way things would work is that we as a country would decide what our main budgetary objectives are, we'd figure out which of them should be done in the public sector and or at the federal level, we'd think about the different policy way, policies that could achieve, achieve those objectives and we'd have an honest debate about the pros and cons of the policies, we would have those policies scored, we'd figure out how we could pay for them, and we would hopefully pass policies that didn't add to the fiscal deteriorating situation that we have now. So if you look at the breakdowns in how we should be making policy, I think I would first point out, I don't think the role that CBO plays is where we should be focusing. To me, there are a lot of different problems and breakdowns in that whole policy area, but getting the numbers and the cost of the policies and the pay-fors is everything else considered working pretty well. Um, I also think during this time of a real fiscal, I'm not going to say crisis, but a really dangerous fiscal situation, having fiscal estimate, estimates is critically important. Right now, our debt relative to the economy is twice the historical average. It's twice where we were when we went into the recession of 2008, which means if and when the economy turns down next, we will have very little fiscal flexibility to respond. Probably worse than where we are right now is where we're headed. We're on track to add as much as $14 trillion to the debt over the next 10 years. These numbers have stopped having meeting because they're so huge, but they're really unimaginable that we're doing that to ourselves. And in recent legislation, we've made this situation considerably worse. Um, our debt is on track to be the size of our entire economy a decade from now. So having an agency that scores legislation, releases projections, and generates options and their savings to address this situation is really critical, particularly at a moment like this. So certainly there are ways CBO could and should be improved. One of the main criticisms, clearly we've talked about this a lot in the last panel, is is there a need for more transparency? And other criticisms include questioning the accuracy of the estimates and how CBO prioritizes its work. More transparency is certainly desirable. Um, and Director Hall has made steps to improve uh, the transparency, and I think that there was a lot of discussion about if and how there could be more that's done there. I do think it's worth considering the tensions and the trade-offs when it comes to things like proprietary data and information so that we want to be careful around there. But listening to this panel that just passed and the other hearings, I feel very confident that people are taking all of those issues into consideration. And bottom line, more transparency is always desirable when the trade-offs aren't too high. There are also additional measures that CBO could take. Um, I think the idea of doing more briefings with members and their staff about their methodologies on things like scoring and baselines would certainly be useful. That way anybody who's interested in learning more can come and talk with them about how those things are done. I mean, it feels like a black box, but it doesn't have to because a lot of what CBO does, they actually make incredibly accessible. We just have to find ways to link that to the members and staff who want to learn more. 
I think doing more to evaluate itself and its track record is certainly useful, and I think that they're on track already doing more of that and considering doing more. Finally, one area I think is really interesting is how to provide more analysis for members who are not in leadership or on the committees of jurisdiction. Um, they want to develop legislation, they want to iterate with CBO, get scores, figure out how things would work, and a lot of times they're frustrated because they don't have the access or ability to do that. So the only way that's going to be possible is if we further resource CBO, give them more money. I would be horribly remiss if I didn't point out that would have to be paid for and shouldn't be added to the debt. Pay go for CBO would be good. Um, but just when I was driving in this morning, I was thinking about how much money in this country we spend on politics versus how much we spend on policy making. And CBO can be a real part of the policy making area, and particularly if that allows more members, those not in leadership, those not on certain committees, to be more engaged in the process. I think that's a real priority. So uh, just quickly, we use CBO's materials, information, scores, methodologies when we do outside work. Like for instance, our organization scores the presidential proposals during the elections. CBO wouldn't be able to do that because they're not, they don't have enough information, they're not full-fledged proposals, but outside groups can. And we and the many other groups that do that rely on CBO's work because it's impartial and it's very important for us also not to be politicized in the work that we do. So I just want to say that as a consumer, I find we couldn't do our jobs if we didn't have the work of CBO to rely on. So every institution can be improved. I, I think it's really important that you're holding these hearings. And again, I think they've gone really well. Um, and so I think we, we launch into assessing the trade-offs, but at the same time, we don't lose the point of ha the really importance of having an impartial arbiter. And we don't lose the focus on the things we need to think about right now, which is how to pass a budget this year and how to deal with the really dangerous national debt situation that we have. So thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you, Ms. McGinnis. Uh, just to, to point out, you did consume more time than you were allocated. I did. And so, um, uh, and with no offset, so. Uh, I'll <laughs> I will apply PAYGO to my answers, to my questions. Just, just kidding. Fair point. Appreciate your testimony. Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make clear that I'm not going to give any offsets to my, uh, I think I'm off budget. I'm not sure, so. <laughs> <laughs> but let me, um, let me thank the Chairman, Ranking Member Yarmouth, uh, all the members of the committee. Um, I really am honored by the opportunity to come here and testify today. Um, it feels a little like a homecoming for me, as you all have heard. I spent many years working at CBO, most of it most closely with a lot of the staff I see around behind the dais. So it feels good to see some friendly faces back there, uh, and, it's, and it's a good experience to be here. I appreciate it very much. Um, I find myself now being the Fourth witness on the fifth hearing, <laughs> basically uh, as you're wrapping these hearings up, at least for now, I concur with everything my um, predecessors on these panels have said. Um, uh, so I'll see if I can give it a slightly different twist. Um, I, I also, and also just based on my experience principally at CBO and now as a uh, senior advisor at BPC, Bipartisan Policy Center, viewing how other agencies and organizations look at CBO's work. I also want to add my congratulations to you on these hearings. I think these are um, have been done in a very methodical, educational way. I think they've provided a real service. Um, and I think that, you know, regular oversight hearings are a good thing. Uh, maybe you don't need five every year, but, but regular oversight hearings are a good thing. And this was necessary, I think, to get off to a good start. Um, as I've said over the years, I've had the advantage of working both inside and outside CBO. And based on that, I've got basically four observations, uh, which I want to share with you, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. First, I just want to make clear that, that along with everyone else, I, I firmly believe that a vibrant, robust, and independent CBO is absolutely essential to Congress in the performance of its Article I duties. At uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center, we especially view CBO as the gold standard of the budget and fiscal and policy analysis. Uh, we don't have this view because CBO's estimates are always right or we always agree with them, but because of CBO's longstanding reputation for objectivity. Uh, I would like to say also, you know, that BPC also stood strongly against the legislation and uh, the proposals that were considered last summer to make drastic cuts in CBO and, and to modify and, and eliminate the Budget Analysis Division. Um, those are the wrong approaches for dealing with the issues that the members uh, and concerns the members have. Uh, some have also advocated um, the use of outside organizations to substitute for CBO and sort of a melding of, of, of estimates from outside policy expectations with, with relevant expertise. Um, this approach is unworkable and uh, I think would actually greatly diminish both the quality and the quantity of the objective analysis and, and estimates that, that members get. 
A nonpartisan analysis is not simply the product of splitting the difference between partisan positions. Uh, secondly, effective communications, as been alluded to here today, is, is between CBO and Congress is one of the agency's biggest challenges. Uh, it's made more difficult by the changes in the budget process over the years that have caused a huge increase in the demand for CBO estimates. As you all know, CBO is directed under the Budget Act to give priority to congressional committees, with leading the, the House and Senate budget committees. But there's, so because of that, they're simply not able to respond to all the requests they get for information and estimates, from, especially from rank and file members. Uh, the frustration this causes is certainly understandable. Um, and CBO acknowledges the problem. I acknowledged it when I was there. It was something we struggled with all the time. Um, but even with the problem of excess demand for CBO estimates, I think you should never feel as though um, you can't get your questions answered um, or, have, or, 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 get, or, or have a sense that the, what the information they're giving you is somehow incomplete. There's always multiple avenues at CBO to get your questions answered, to get extra information. You may not like the answer you get, but you should get your questions responded to. Third, the issue of transparency, which is, which is the big one. Um, and, and CBO's analyses and its transparency of its analyses are more, more, is more critical than ever, I would say. Uh, CBO already devotes considerable time to this, as you all know, but they acknowledge they could do a much better job. The difficulty is that they're just stretched too thin. Uh, this really is, as others have said, this is, this, this is a resource question. And I think that a better approach, rather than posting models on the website or something like that, is to actually provide CBO with the additional resources and dedicate it explicitly to transparency. And you could have CBO report to you annually or have a hearing annually on what progress has been made uh, on, these, on these efforts for transparency. Fourth and finally, I'd like to, to, to sort of pat the budget committee on the back and also give a little push. Because I think the budget committee is, is a, is a, has a key role to play here in helping CBO address members' concerns and also helping it to be a more effective organization. I think working with CBO to address these concerns is much more productive than putting in place well-meaning statutory requirements uh, to post models or to, to cost uh, contract out estimates. Um, in my view, as I finish up, uh, I think the real issue hampering CBO's effectiveness and responsiveness is something the committee is all too uh, aware of, and that is the, the broader issues in the dysfunction of the budget process. Um, at BPC, we see um, we have high hopes for the Joint Select Committee on Budget Reform, uh, which, is, which is just starting its work. Uh, we have lots of thoughts uh, on um, budget process ideas, including biennial budgeting and ways to help strengthen the budget committee that we feel would, would make some real improvements, which we'd be happy to share with you. Um, but in conclusion, what I'd like to say is just for you all to remember one thing, that the CBO works for you. Uh, the people at the agency um, are dedicated to its mission, fully dedicated to its mission. I ask you to work with them, ask for explanations, be persistent. Take a visit to the Ford building, fourth floor. Um, just show up. <laughs> I know they're cringing down there as I say this, but, but seriously, it should be an open institution. Walk in to get your questions answered. If you can't get it over the phone, walk down and pay them a visit. I urge the Budget Committee to continue to work with CBO um, to resolve these issues of concern. CBO's critical mission to support Congress and its budgetary duties depends on it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, both panelists, uh, I'm going to lead uh, with a couple of questions here and then I'll yield to the ranking member and, and my fellow colleagues on the right over here uh, for their questions. It has been pretty universal in, the, in both panels uh, that there is a need for CBO with, with the ability to maintain oversight. And then, uh, Mr. Davis, in your comments, you talked about uh, if, if we don't resource them properly, if indeed we were to cut CBO, uh, that it would uh, create, at a minimum, some stress on the organization to be able to achieve its uh, congressional mission. Uh, but uh, speak to that just a little bit more. If, if, if we don't resource them adequately, then uh, I, I guess it suggests that w the information that we're going to get from them is going to be less than the product that we perhaps want to see. Is that an accurate assessment? Well, I, I, th I think the remarkable thing to me is that uh, CBO has been able to do the level, amount, and quality of work that it's done over the years. Um, despite, especially in recent years, having insufficient resources to handle it. I think you have to remember CBO is essentially the same size it's been um, 
for many years. Um, and while the workload has vastly increased, um, I think that um, the quality of the work will not be affected, is not affected. I think that um, their ability to explain, uh, to make clear the basis for the analysis, for the estimates, is the thing that's going to suffer. And it may have suffered uh, in recent years because if, if as, as Dr. Rivlin said, if you're getting pressed for an estimate by Wednesday morning and it's Tuesday night, you're not going to have a lot of a time to write up and explain that estimate. So I think in my view, it's the resources that would help them devote some time to that effort at transparency that, that's really the key. Ms. McGinnis, we, um, we as, as you know, we had a hearing on the, on the behavior modeling. And, uh, and I, I kind of likened it to um, uh, baseball season was getting underway at the time we had the hearing and was talking about, uh, you know, batters, hitters that face a multitude of different pitches. If everything was a fastball, they'd probably be able to time it, hit it, and uh, with a lot of accuracy and out of the ballpark a lot of times. Uh, but we know that pitchers mix up their pitches now and they throw a lot of, s a lot of things that move in different directions. It's kind of like our you know, life comes at us that way. And, um, and certainly CBO faces a lot of uh, change-ups and curved balls and every once in a while a spitter comes their way uh, or they, they throw those at the, at the hitters. How difficult is it for us to actually model to the extent where we can be confident in, uh, in, in the product? Okay, so my office is cringing right now because I'm not known for doing really well with sports analogies. <laughs> Nonetheless, I, I have gotten to, the, to where we are. Sure, right, particularly recently with healthcare, CBO has been dealing with huge new issues that have been moving at a very quick pace. Or I thought Doug Holtz Aiken gave a great example on trying to score risk terrorism reinsurance. When you have a oh. whole new thing, uh, one thing you can be confident is that the projections and the answers aren't going to be perfect. They couldn't be. So what we're really striving for is to understand and believe that they will credibly be not biased in any one direction and that they will be open to ongoing input so that those models are regularly it, uh, updated and that we're learning as when there are things that um, don't, uh, don't come out as projected we're taking those results and updating the models and the behavioral assumptions. So I think what you can ask for is that you trust and that you're confident that it's not, there's no bias in what you're getting out of uh, the best that they can do and that they're regularly learning. And nobody can do uh, perfect spot on projections for any of these new big areas that we're moving into. And I would just add, members of Congress on these big issues are wanting answers more and more quickly, which goes to the resource question that Sandy discussed, which is why the more people working on it, the faster the turnaround could be. Well, your organization and, and the BPC also kind of, uh, they, they're able to kind of see how uh, complicated matters are when there are substantive changes in the economy, in healthcare, and you know, the, the lifespan, the average lifespan is getting longer and longer and all, and all the technological changes and all those kinds of things. So um, both of you, uh, I, I'm sure, would, would agree that, uh, that th there's no real uh, definitive answer to it. It's not as simple as a math question for a lot of things. We've got behavior involved here and we've got a lot of external conditions that, uh, uh, that have to be considered. And so the modeling piece of CBO is an ever-changing thing, right? Um, I'll just, yes, sir. I think that, that, that you've hit the nail right on the head. Um, it, you model it, models require additional work to be updated. I, and I, like Maya, I'm the last person you want to t be talking about models. I, I appreciate it and uh, knew I'll the talk about models. I you can talk about, about sports. Models. Talking about sports, I'll tell you, the pitches that they worry about at CBO are the ones that hit their heads. The ones that are up and in, that's all I'll say. <laughs> so, I'm just being facetious. Um, but, but I do think you're correct. It's, it requires um, a lot of tending and effort and um, analysis itself. So that's where I talk about the need for resources to do that. It's hard to do that sort of concurrently when you're pushing to get the estimate and the analysis out the door. But it's necessary, it's important. Part of it is writing that up in a clear way that members can understand and appreciate. Um, Part of it is just having the time to do it um, and, and, and the resources, quite frankly, to do it. 
Yeah, Mr. Yarmouth, myself, Mr. Woodall are all on the Select Committee for Budget Process Reform. Uh, can both of you, in just a minute or so, because I'm going to run out of time, could both of you just give us a foretaste of what your uh, initial suggestion would be or your strong guidance would be to the Select Committee? You got three of them sitting here. Sure. I'm, I'm so pleased that this uh, Joint Select Committee is occurring, and I'm hopeful that it will be able to make progress. Um, it's kind of like when we started tax reform and you could look at the tax code and say, well, if there's one thing we can agree on, it's broken, we need to fix it. I think we all feel that way, that with the budget process there's a lot of improvements we could make. Um, so starting from smaller to, to larger, I think there are a number of, they're not really incremental, but smaller changes within the existing process that could and should be made, including ensuring that a budget is in place. I concurred uh, with, I think it was Congressman McClintock who was saying that until a budget is in place, you should not be able to pass legislation that affects, that costs money. I like those ideas. Um, I think auto CRs are something to think about. Um, and I think joint budget resolution where you have the President and Congress agree in the beginning so that you have a real law is important for this to be taken more seriously. The budget just doesn't have the teeth that it needs to at this point. It's kind of absurd that we have budgets in place and then have subsequent, if we have budgets in place, I should say, the subsequent policies are often completely at odds with that budget and regularly members don't even realize that they're inconsistent. Um, second, I think doing more to avoid the gimmicks that exist in the budget. So everything from timing gimmicks to using Roth IRAs and pension smoothing, which we all know are multi massive gimmicks to look like you're paying things when they're not. Um, just going through the gimmicks, we just produced a hit big report in gimmicks, but figuring out how to address those. Focusing on strengthening enforcement. We just had a moment where pretty much everybody was on board to waive PAYGO for the tax bill. Very few people realized, I mean, that was allowing a massive, massive change in the budget, the tax bill added to the debt, getting rid of PAYGO allowed that to happen. PAYGO needs to be a stronger mechanism. Uh, focusing more in the long term, so where we can have projections and think about the effects in the long term and also let savings that occur in the long term give you credit today so you have a political incentive to generate long term savings. And ultimately, I'd like to see a bigger overhaul that helps improve very poor fiscal outcomes. And I'd recommend considering something like debt targets and triggers to get you there along the year for a multi-year budget. So that's kind of from smaller, more manageable to bigger. It's not a time where it's easy to get anything done. So I'd also encourage you to figure out as much as you can push for and get that done because we need a win. We, we need Congress to come together and work on something and succeed at something that moves us in the right direction. Mr. Davis. Yes, sir. I think, um, you know, Maya's laid out some really good ideas and proposals. I think that um, her point about, you know, needing a win uh, is important. So I would say, you know, try not to bite off too much more than you can chew. Uh, you've got a relatively quick turnaround, and I think the focus on, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, making the trains run on time uh, could be the, the, the biggest thing that you could do to advance the budget process. At, at the Bipartisan Policy Center, um, uh, we have a series of ideas. Uh, Dr. Dr. Rivlin mentioned her work with Senator Domenici um, on a series of budget process proposals, which was done through the Bipartisan Policy Center. He was a senior fellow there. Um, a couple of the key ideas from that uh, that I would encourage the committee to think about. Uh, the first is biennial budgeting. There's been some mention of that here today uh, as a way to sort of ease uh, the pressure on, on the budgetary agenda and on Congress and free up some time for actual congressional oversight in a second session of Congress. I think another idea which, which we would stress, uh, I mentioned in my testimony, is ways to, to strengthen the budget committee, uh, to make it a, a leadership committee uh, in a sense that would uh, create more of a sense of urgency and importance for the budget resolution process. Broadly speaking, I think the process can be made to work, uh, but it, it needs more support uh, from leadership levels and needs to be made a priority. Um, and I think, you know, lastly, I'll mention that you know, something like an automatic continuing resolution is worth thinking about. Uh, there are obviously issues that you have to deal with about creating incentives not to get the work done and living under constant CRs, but I think that there are ways to deal with that. Uh, to just take away the uncertainty, the possibilities of a government shutdown. Thanks to both of you. Mr. Yarman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank both the witnesses. Also, uh, I have this knack of for asking questions that I really don't expect a certain answer to. I'm just actually curious. And it, it occurred to me that something that might be useful is if we asked CBO to, as a matter of course, do a score on a, an enacted piece of legislation every two years or so um, 
above some level, so you know five billion dollars or whatever hypothetically some building that so with that it, with the ACA we would have a score every two years as to what it looked like for the next ten and I mean obviously we don't want to add too much to the CBO's uh, plate, but since they had already done a lot of the work, the incremental work might not be all that <coughs> require all that many additional resources what just I just threw that out Mr. Davis what do you um, how do you react so to it, that it, you're talking about a reassessment of something that's been enacted into law just to keep track uh, of, mm -hmm. of how the you know what the original estimate said how far off it was what actual spending is um, that can be a tricky thing to do and, and in some cases almost impossible because it depends on the change that's been enacted. If you've made changes um, to an existing program and these changes get all wrapped up with what already existed under current law, it, it may be hard to parse out those, how those differences made changes versus what was already under current law. Mm -hmm. But if you've created a new program, for example, uh, like uh, Congress did under Medicare Part D, a uh, new prescription drug benefit, that's something that can be tracked and that's something CBO has tracked um, and, and kept track of the, their estimates versus uh, how it's actually mm -hmm. turned out. And uh, as folks are aware, uh, their estimates were too high initially, that the cost of pres the prescription drug benefit wasn't as high as originally estimated. Um, I think that's, you know, in part what a baseline is. You sort of take stock um, every few months of where current law spending is now, parsing it by individual programs like that is, is more of a challenge, but I think for new programs that have been enacted, it's a fair question to ask. If you want to say, we did this, this was our expectation at the time, how has it turned out? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a fair question. Uh, I don't have any, uh, anything else I want to ask, but just give you both an opportunity, since I have all this time left, uh, to talk about anything you've heard today so far that you were just chomping at the bit to, it's a horse racing term, uh, <laughs> To, uh, resp to react to if, while you were sitting and watching and listening? Uh, I'll react to something. I'll try to do this the right way, which was um, I, I thought Alice and Doug both did fabulous jobs of pointing out the tensions and sort of I took from, I, I heard Alice talk a lot about what the real big priorities that we should be focusing on are and I thought Doug did an incredible job of showing a bunch of the tensions between making changes and the pros and cons and not portraying things as black and white. But one of the things I kept he hearing was kind of a frustration with our fiscal situation that was being a little bit pushed on CBO. And so I'm going to politely push back and say that the fiscal situation and the broken budget process comes from Congress. It doesn't come from the Congre Congressional Budget Office. And so what we need to do is help CBO put out the kinds of things that will enable Congress to do what many, uh, most people I think want to do, many people want to do, which has put us on a more fiscally sound track and have a budget that functions better, but because of the political environment in which you exist, that is really difficult. You don't want to politicize CBO, but I spend my weekends, I'm sure some of you are or have been soccer parents, right? I spend my weekends listening to parents on the soccer sidelines yelling at the ref, and it is unbelievable how it turns out the ref is always against our team, but never is against the other team, right? And so you kind of want to say <clears throat> it probably evens out when the ref makes a mistake or not. I think CBO really does do that. And I think we have to focus more on what is it that's making it impossible to get the right fiscal outcomes that we want. So I would just keep turning the picture back to what, what the big fiscal situation is, how we're going to budget in a way that really reflects and pushes for our national pr priorities and thinks about the trade-offs to get there. So um, that was my big picture thinking. But then again, I sit there and I think about the national debt pretty much no matter what is going on. That's kind of where I am. The reason I ended up in this field is because I had a normal job working on Wall Street and finance, and I read a CBO report in the 90s, and it was one of the most interesting things it was unbiased, it was fair, and it, had, it talked about deficits of $203 billion, and I was really concerned. I think that was the number. Um, and things have really deteriorated since then. And the big picture is what are we going to do to change it? And just, Mr. Chairman, to one more answer to your question about Joint Select Committee, one thing I didn't mention that I think would be really important is looking at putting caps on the full <coughs> budget, not just discretionary like we did at Sequester, but thinking about how you include mandatory and tax expenditures, which really are spending through the tax code. There's a trillion of them a year. So looking at those pieces of the budget also and figuring out how to cap them. Mr. Just Davis, any, anything that 
Just very briefly, there's always going to be conflict with CBO. It's a nonpartisan institution. Congress is a partisan institution. They get it. They get it. Um, it's been the days from Alice when she tried when they did an analysis of the Carter Energy Plan uh, for a democratically controlled Congress. It wasn't too popular at that point. Uh, it's been that way throughout CBO's history. So I wouldn't worry about taking issue with CBO. Um, they actually want to hear from you. Um, I would, if, you, if it's done in the right way, um, as a way to try to improve things, I, that's not a problem at all. They, they want the communication. Great. Well, once again, thank you both for your testimony. I yield back, Mr. I Chairman. I thank the ranking member. Then, you know, Ms. McGinnis, for somebody that says they're not good with sports metaphors, you gave us a good one. <laughs> they're on the soccer field. So, uh, anyway, Mr. Woodall from Georgia. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, Mr. Davis, I want to start with you. You said uh, in your encouragement for us to go down to the Ford Building to remember that CBO works uh, uh, for you. Right. Uh, but in both of your written testimonies, you talked about the importance of an independent uh, CBO. In, in my uh, mind, those two things uh, are, are categorical opposites. Either you work for me and you do what I tell you to do, or you get to do whatever you want to do uh, because you're, uh, you're independent. Uh, help me to uh, understand having your inside uh, uh, view uh, that uh, distinction between working uh, for us and yet uh, again only staff director on all of Capitol Hill who's going to come sit at the witness table and tell the committee for which they work uh, how it is. So let me say I, I understand what you're saying and I understand the, the, the frustration with that um, and, and the distinction you made between OMB and CBO and with Dr. Rivlin. Um, I think um, I think what it boils down to is sort of what you mean by advice. I think like the folks at CBO uh, will sit down and talk with you about anything you want to talk about. And you can run your ideas past them. They can tell you what economics says about those ideas, what their analysis indicates about those ideas, what additional options may be. But the difficulty is, is they have to be consistent with the advice and the information and the analysis they give to everybody. And they've got 535 masters when you bring in the Senate. I know we don't like to talk about the Senate in the House, but when you do that, that's a, that's, that's a lot. So that it's more about the consistency of the advice, making sure independence also means nonpartisan. Um, and independence means not captured by one party or the other, or beholden to one uh, committee or another, and working for all of the Congress. Um, so I think that you, know, you can have <clears throat> conversations with the director. Uh, you can go one-on-one -on -one with the director. And you can raise some of these issues. And they can put it in context for you. The same can be done at the staff level. It's just a matter of understanding that they have to give the same set of basic analysis to everyone. And everyone has the benefit of their thinking. And it may not line up with a particular policy position or not. My view is that when the Budget Act set things up, they set up CBO to be that source of nonpartisan independence for Congress. Just for, and when I say independence, independent for Congress. And the budget committees were set up as the policy arm. So it was the, the, the budget committees that were sort of set the policy positions using that nonpartisan analysis um, and go forward from there to be the policy, the, so policy ideas and not so much CBO okay. on the policy side. Ms. McGinnis, you said you wished we were focused on bigger picture issues than, than, just, policy, uh, than just process, and yet we probably spend more time arguing about the referees uh, than we do focusing on uh, the underlying policy. It seems to me we should be pushing the referees to the background. They should be referees uh, of the behind-the-scenes conversation, but they shouldn't uh, rise to the level of importance that it gets in the way of the actual policy conversation we're trying to have. Okay, so I think you've asked the most interesting questions in this whole, the, this whole hearing, because I'm still thinking about the ones you asked the previous panel about CBO versus OMB. Um, and they're really thoughtful. I think that CBO, we need a referee, and we need a referee that we agree is doing a good job, and that's why oversight committee hearings are really important. But then we need to spend our time disagreeing or fighting or evaluating the policies rather than CBO when we don't like the scores that we're getting on things, which is not to say that they're perfect. It's just to say we need to be debating those bigger issues. That CBO, a score it, may, it, it has, isn't going to be as important as spending our time thinking about what it means to add $14 trillion to the debt. So I'm thinking about relative energy. I'm also thinking about the real importance of getting a budget resolution passed that hopefully has reconciliation, which has savings in it. So all the kinds of things that are really going to improve the fiscal situation. And to your, to your specific question, I think CBO needs to be apolitical, but also accountable. And I think 
you all set a set of rules for them, which they then need to enact and follow in an apolitical manner, and if and when it's appropriate, you change those rules. But it is different than OMB because they're accountable to two different parties with different policy preferences, and they don't come back and say, oh, I do think this about a policy, or I think that's a good or a bad goal, the way they would if they were OMB, and that's just the nature of having one president versus all members of Congress. The, let me ask, finally, I, I didn't realize OMB had so many non-economists working for them. I'm sorry, CBO had as many non-economists working for them until the chairman uh, and the ranking member had this series of hearings. Uh, CRS has twice the resources that CBO uh, has. Uh, is there a downside uh, for us uh, partnering uh, those two agencies, uh, both charged with providing nonpartisan uh, counsel? Well, a um, couple things. My view, they, they have different, having worked at CRS too, um, their, their missions are different. Um, you know, at CR, CRS is, is, has to be broadly, it's basically Congress's research arm. Uh, they don't, they, they, they aren't required to set priorities um, or don't have to set priorities like CBO does for the type of work that, that, that CBO engages in. Um, so while there are some similarities, the, the broad sort of budgetary and economic analysis that CBO does is different uh, from the policy analysis and research done at CRS. I think you've got to have, in, in my perspective, I, you need to have a, a single entity uh, that's producing cost estimates and other analysis that's used in the budget process. Um, and there's important work to be done on transparency and effective communications um, and taking into account, you know, all the latest research. But I think a single entity providing that is important to avoid um, confusion in the budget process, to make sure that there's like a level playing field uh, of estimates and analysis that's used to support that. So I think that the two agencies are distinct. There is an importance that they, they be distinct because they have just um, completely different missions. Mr. Chairman, thank I, you for inviting oh, me. I, I, want to, I want to give uh, Ms. McGinnis uh, an, an opportunity to uh, answer that question I, as well. I think it's an intriguing idea. I, I think there could be some real potential in that. I don't know the details of what the downside would be, but I think it's intriguing. Thank you. Mr. Renacci, Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank both panel members. Um, you know, I love budget meetings. I was a business guy for 30 years. I get frustrated every time I hear because we're all talking about the answers. I mean, I still remember somebody told me uh, in leadership one time, budget is not a, it's just a, a vision, it's not a path. No, the budget should be a path, not a vision. We have to have a path, we have to follow the path. Um, but I want to I want to flip back to CBO because my biggest frustration with CBO is, uh, you know, in the business world, and, and I was a turnaround guy, so I'd have, I'd take over businesses that were in trouble, and then I'd bring my CBO in, my individual, and I would tell him, give me an analysis, and I need to make some decisions based on your analysis. And what he would do, or she, depending on who it was, they'd give me best case, worst case, and then I knew where I was at, best case, worst case. The problem we have here is that CBA gives us only case. And I think that's a problem. So the best example I can give you, and, and that's where my frustration comes, is uh, CBO's estimate of the amount of Americans who would no longer have insurance under the repeal of individual mandate, I brought this up at one of the previous hearings, was significantly different than an estimate from S&P, close to 10 million different. Um, so for members of Congress, I think it's important to have an understanding and to try and decide how confident we can be with CBO. I think we could be much more confident, confident when somebody comes in and says, best case, worst case, and then you make your decisions, because mm -hmm. there's no single case, there's no individual case. Mr. Davis, I'd just like you to tell me your thoughts on that. Well, I, um, it's a good point, and what I think, what I would say is that, broadly speaking, that, that's sort of what CBO tries to do in its analysis. Um, what CBO says is, is what, the, what they try to do, the, the basis of their analysis is to sort of try to find the, the, the middle of the range of expected outcomes, taking into account uh, what outcomes are based on research and data and information, their experience, what the models show about a particular outcome for a particular policy. Because what they, what they do, and it's been said before at this hearing, is, is to try to prepare estimates and analysis to support the budget process. Um, and the budget process, you know, requires essentially a set of, of single numbers, of single estimates for typically a 10-year period. Um, so that's, that's their thinking. They're also, um, in, in, you know, uh, have to use a budget baseline. They're under the Budget Act, required to use a current law baseline. That often will, that informs their analysis. That's the basis of their analysis. So I know that may cause some frustration. But to your, to your broader point, I mean, hopefully, 
you know, it, when they write this, when they write up their analyses, when they, when they try to discuss all the elements and the assumptions, that sort of they broadly discuss what the wide range is, what sort of the broad best case and worst case scenarios are uh, in the form of writing up what they think their best analysis is, which is that sort of middle of the range of distributions. They're trying to give their best judgment based on all the information they're aware of. Well, the, that's why we need more transparency, absolutely. So we can see what best case, worst case, because we get these numbers and then everybody lives I agree. and dies by these numbers. I which, agree. Um, you know, it's interesting. Dr. Rulin in the, in the last uh, session said that uh, the biggest problem is we need to get the House, the Senate, and the President to sit down and review revenues, expenses, and debt and make decisions in totality. I think that is true. Mm -hmm. It's too bad we don't get to that point because uh, that's where I think CBO would be, um, would be helpful. And uh, Ms. McGinnis, again, I appreciate We've had lots of conversations over the years about the budget process and the national debt and the deficits, and uh, I admire your commitment to be a leading voice on the importance of this issue. How do you think CBO can help? Um, we don't talk enough about that. Should they be talking about it? Um, and how can they help members of Congress in that area? Because I think it's important. That should be the starting point. I know they dig down in this legislation. The big picture is we're going in the wrong direction. And I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, my guess is that uh, for folks who work at CBO, they probably are painfully aware of just how fiscally unsustainable our path is because you cannot look at a CBO document and not come away with that. That's exactly why I <laughs> switched careers into doing this when I read it because the numbers tell the story. Um, I think as, as Alice Ridland said, it's absolutely right that they don't come out and say to Congress, you know, you need to do this, that they don't push policies more. They, they, they shouldn't be in the role of telling folks what to do. But unfortunately, the numbers are so bad that they speak for themselves. So this really is an issue of, it shouldn't be up for de debate it's a, if it's a problem. Anybody who looks at a CBO document is going to know that it's a problem, that the debt is growing faster than the economy as far as the eye can see. So I think just continuing to publish their reports and then we all have the role of making them uh, more, putting them on a bigger platform. That's something that, that you've worked on very clearly and strongly, which is how you kind of have overall national reports to the country about the fiscal state. So I think members of Congress take what CBO does, just the numbers, and they use it to make that picture clear. The, the only issue, and I know I've run out of time, is that there are many members, look, we're a representative of government, so a lot of members don't understand those reports when they come out. I do, you do, and others do, but I still think we have to make sure they're, they're emphasizing that because too many times we make decisions based on the next election, not the next generation. I yield back. Mr. Arrington, Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I want to thank the panelists for your counsel and uh, your presence here today. I find myself in uh, enthusiastic agreement with a lot of what you've said, but in the interest of time, let me, let me go to the nuts and bolts of CBO, because I think that's the main purpose here, although I'd like to go to the to the real threat, which is the debt and deficit spending. And uh, let me make one comment on that, uh, because I'd, I agree with Ms. McGinnis that the CBO has little to nothing to do with stopping this train wreck that's going to happen if we don't change our behavior. It's the will of the United States Congress, plain and simple. We can make some reforms on process. We might even be able to put some accountability measures in there that could help. But ultimately, it's the collective will of the United States Congress. And as a new member, I'm awfully discouraged uh, by my first year and, and what we were able to do, even as a majority, I'll just say it, to send a budget that finally got at the drivers of the debt, which is our mandatory spending programs, reduce that more than we have in 20 years, send it to a majority, simple majority Republican Senate because it was reconciliation, and then they didn't do it, they pulled it out. So uh, it's an interesting way to start my uh, time here in Congress. Nuts and bolts, is, would you agree with me, Mr. Davis, that the success for CBO is um, delivering timely and accurate information to this committee so we can do our job? Um, as best they can, yes, sir. To I put it simply. Yes, yes. Um, so, I subscribe to the Peter Drucker, if you can't m measure it, you can't manage it. How well are, is CBO doing on delivering timely and accurate information? I think considering the demand that they're under, I think they do really, really well. They have to set priorities. Do you I have think proof for the key of that? Do you have proof of that? Can you give me a scorecard? 
How often have they been right? Uh, to me, this is also the biggest challenge, one of the big, bigger challenges in this oversight role that we have in Congress is, I don't know which programs are working, which ones aren't. We fund unauthorized programs. I can't tell you how many hearings I've had where I just ask the simple question, what is success, how do you measure it, and how are we doing? And I, I, I think CBO, if we're gonna manage it and at least oversee the management of CBO, we need to be able to ascertain their success rate. And with some reasonable sort of margin for error, how are, what's their batting average? And then where can we then identify uh, making adjustments and improvements? I certainly think resources are a part of the sort of universal best practice for organizational excellence. And if they need more resources, mm -hmm. I, I think we need to talk about it and I think we need to do it but they need accountability too, and I, I don't have a scorecard. Is that fair for me to make, draw that conclusion at this point? I think it's absolutely fair for you to, to ask the question and to want this information. I think also that the, the, the metric that I would use um, is, is not so much accuracy, which accuracy is critical, but accuracy is gonna be dependent upon the information they have in a given setting at a given time. It's more the process that they go through. Are you satisfied that what they're doing is pulling in information that's objective and that in fully informs their analysis. If you don't think so, if you've got information you think they should have, then you should share it with them. Or if you think it's not well explained, you should share it with them. Um, I think, but I think it's more about their, their process, uh, staying true to being independent and objective. And I can only Check judge numbers. the inputs by the outcomes. Right. I, if, I, if I know they're hitting the target reasonably well, then I can say the inputs must be good. If they're not, let's look at the inputs, let's look at the process. But to me, you gotta start there. We don't, I don't have much visibility. Uh, I do think that peer, peer review or some vetting would be uh, very important to this process. I consider it important to all the work that I do uh, before I complete something or submit something. Uh, Ms. McGinnis, what do you think about the, quote, peer review process or the vetting process for, with respect to CBO and their information and analysis. I know they have an advisory board. Is it the right board? Do we have the right people? Yeah, I like your question um, a lot. And, and I heard uh, Keith Hall testify about considering the analysis of the actuals, which seems like the kind of things in the right direction. So certainly there should be an ongoing evaluation of how they performed. One of the important things is then to break out they'll be wrong on every single number. Nobody will be right on each number. Right. But when they were wrong because the policies, the models, the behavioral assumptions were wrong, or when they were wrong because things that changed in the economy or other policies changed the outcome. So we have to be really clear to do that and make sure that the numbers are used responsibly. Um, and yeah, I, peer reviewing is an interesting idea. I looked through the panel of advisors right before I was doing this testimony just to make sure that they were as diverse and solid as I thought they were, and they seem like an excellent panel of advisors. So I might I would have focused on let's make sure they are really truly engaged at a deep level, and I've talked to a number of them over the years who are, um, but I think peer review makes complete sense. I think if people are concerned that the outside perspectives that CBO's getting are not diverse enough, we should by all means recommend that they talk to additional academics and experts. I thank both of you. Uh, my time has expired. Mr. Palmer, Alabama. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. McGinnis, I've I've heard it said that getting a good CBO score is similar to getting a good SAT or ACT score. A lot of it comes down to just being good at taking the test. Can you uh, discuss some of the uh, budget tricks and gimmicks uh, commonly used to get favorable CBO scores? And if you can, I, I've, I've got a couple of things I want to point out. Yeah, um, as I mentioned, we just came up with a huge long list. We did a report documenting gimmicks, and uh, I was somewhat stunned to learn just how many there really are that are utilized. And we were very concerned about publishing it, of course, because it felt like we were doing the bomb maker's manual and saying, here's the instructions to use all the gimmicks instead of don't use them. So don't read it if you want to use them. Only read it if you want to stop them. Back to sports metaphors and not bomb makers. Okay, sorry. <laughs> right. Um, so I think the most important one is Timing, expirations, right? When you have things that expire, which aren't intended to expire, after this I'm going to talk uh, about tax extenders. Tax extenders is a perfect example of where things that aren't paid for, are planned to expire, and then when it comes due, we say, well, we need to extend these and we shouldn't pay for them, even though they weren't paid for before. Or pay-fors that are put into legislation in the out years, 
when everybody knows that nobody actually assumes that they're going to get paid for. And we have a lot of recent examples of that, too. And you have both, both parties voting to never let those pay fors kick in. Well, there's other issues that uh, we've seen over the years. I ran a think tank for 24 years and um, was involved, um, did a lot of work at the federal level. And I saw things like on the, on the Affordable Care Act, for instance, the Class Act. The Class Act was a big timing gimmick, yeah, a huge was, timing gimmick. Yeah, it was a joke, but, it, but the CBO allowed itself to be manipulated into, into that and, and uh, to show uh, uh, less of a, a, a negative impact on the federal deficit. So Sandy would know better than I, but I actually think a lot of those rules come from the Budget Committee right. to CBO. I, I don't disagree, but uh, so they I took advantage CBO of the fact that the CBO does 10-year scoring, and the Class Act was five years. Well, that, that, that's the budget window was the issue there. Yeah, the budget CBO window. CBO was fully transparent about the yeah. effects beyond the budget window. But, but the, was, but the CBO has got to have the ability and, and take the responsibility to point these things out. And I'll give you another one. So I just uh, I, I do think though the way that it works is that the rules are given to CBO and the question is if CBO is following those rules I, and then I, what rules should we I, change I, and there I'm are many going, that should be changed. I'm going to make a closing statement about that because I think this is right in line with what we're trying to do with the budget reform and appropriations task force to, to fix this because the CBO is under certain rules and and guidance that, that I think hampers its ability to, to do a better job. But I'll give you another example of a, a gimmick was Waxman Mark, uh, Markey, uh, when the CBO projected that uh, by 2020, that uh, the house, the increase from cap and trade would only be about $175 per household. And they arrived at that by virtue of the fact that, that uh, rising prices would force more households into lower income brackets and lower their taxes. And it was a, a perverse uh, way of saying that all these people would get a tax cut because they were f their their incomes were impacted and they went into a lower tax bracket. That, to me, that's the gimmick of all gimmicks, Mr. Chairman. And it and it and at that one, I, I and certainly I, I would not accuse the CBO of being political, but it that there seemed to be some bias there toward that legislation to try to sell it, and that could have been from the Budget Committee as well. I, I, I don't know. I, I, uh, if, that was if, in 2010. If I can respond briefly, I, I don't recall the specific circumstances of that, but what I can tell you is CBO goes through a process of estimating legislation as it's drafted. Um, this could have been part of an iterative process for drafting legislation. Um, they're using the underlying baseline assumptions they would normally use, economic assumptions. I'm sure there's lots of uncertainties, but it was based on the legislative language they were, that they put in front of them to estimate. I was very involved in that, and, um, and the, I won't get into the real numbers and how it would impact uh, people, but I, I grew up dirt poor, so I, I paid potential of uh, specific, uh, and specific attention to, to things, how it impacts lower income families. And it would have, in terms of, a, uh, as a percentage of their disposable income, the bottom quintile would have been five times higher than the top quintile. My, the point I want to make in, in closing is, uh, and, and Mr. Chairman, I think this again is, is, will be helpful for the work that, that the select committee is doing, is that the CBO is under certain rules that prohibit them from, from doing uh, better analysis. My opinion, for instance, they're prohibited from taking into account uh, savings that arise from um, uh, efforts to combat waste. And, and my pet peeve right now is, is improper payments. Um, and, and then in other areas where there, it requires a front end investment, it might be more technology, you know, upgrading technology, they score that as a cost without taking into account the savings, and, and I really think that this is a way that we can help the CBO, and uh, particularly in, in the work being done by the Select Committee. Uh, so I don't blame the CBO for, for all of its, its failures, but I do think we've got to eliminate the gimmicks and we've got to put them in a position where they give us accurate estimates. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Bergman, Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks to both of you. Um, I'm. I guess I, I feel sad for some of my colleagues across the aisle, especially the freshmen who aren't here, because as a freshman, you get to you come to learn, you come to you know crawl, walk, run, and this is uh, these type of hearings are very educational for for folks who are first time um, 
um, legislators, if you will. Uh, now, I'm maybe dating myself a little bit, as but I look around the room, especially behind me, I know there's some in the same category who remember a comic strip called Pogo. And it was uh, probably some of the best political commentary of its time. And there was a character in there by the name of Churchy Lefemme who I think one of his famous statements was, we have met the enemy and he is us, okay? In the, uh, in the earlier panel, uh, former Director Rivlin said, uh, quote, every other year it will be a different Congress. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the challenges that that presents. Well, I, I'll, I'll just start off briefly. I think that for, for CBO, I mean, there, there's two challenges, I guess. There's the policy challenge of new policymakers coming in, new set of priorities, more, you know, additional difficulty trying to reach broad agreement on budget priorities. Um, for CBO, there's um, the new set of folks who may or may not understand, as you were saying, how it works, how their process works, um, who under the Budget Act they, they uh, give priorities for. Um, so, and, and how, they, how an independent, how a nonpartisan entity works in a broader partisan institution. And that's often a, a, a difficult challenge for them. Um, I think she may Is have Is it the right answer? Then do you, if you think about, if, if in fact, we have every two years, it's a, and pardon me for interrupting, but you know, no. the, the time moves on. Um, have we created a long-term problem for ourselves in 21st century technology and the rate at which things change, information flows, data is accumulated and analyzed? Have we created an uns we, we know we've created a fiscally unsustainable pathway. I mean, I don't think there's any disagreement as we just look at the pure raw numbers. Have we, through how we conduct our business as a Congress now, and then the expectations that are laid upon CBO, because you're working with a new Congress every two years, have we created an unsustainable path for ourselves as a continually changing Congress? That's what I really would like to hear your thoughts on. You mean the fiscal challenge, the long term fiscal, or just the The, fa the names and faces names changing and faces. here every two years. I, th I think, frankly, every think two, every years. two years, right? I mean, that's our electoral process. I mean, and, and it is a challenge. I think that's why um, uh, the role of this committee um, is is important um, in sort of helping to orient members um, to the process, to the role of CBO. I'll also call out um, you as a freshman member. You can appreciate this. I remember in my time at CBO, Congressman Renacci. Uh, paired up with uh, his, his uh, Democrat, Jim Carney, um, who's now governor of Delaware, and they formed a, a bipartisan freshman group, and they wanted to hear from CBO on a regular basis to discuss a range of issues, uh, scoring matters, baseline rules, what's up with this, um, we're hearing this, can you explain it for us, that sort of constant interaction um, by a group of members. They just pulled together informally was really, I think, it was very helpful and constructive. So those kinds of things I help with a over two year changeover all the time uh, can help. Individual members can band together, budget committees can uh, Based on that, based on that history, uh, since we, um, again, the, the finite thing here is time and two years is the time, are we any better at bringing freshmen up to speed and getting them productive sooner or are we stuck in that treadmill of we go over the same class. It's kind of like teaching flying. Mm -hmm. Every time a new student comes into that airplane, you know they're gonna make the same mistakes because that's the learning process. Are we wasting time and money the way we do things today? I, I don't think so. I think it's just the challenge of our electoral system. And I so think we, we have to, to accept, effort. that's a brutal reality we have to accept. We're gonna have turnover every two years and deal with the changes. As, yes, I think. Thank you, Mr. Team. Chairman, I yield back. Oh, that's such a good question. No other members uh, have appeared uh, to seek time uh, with our witnesses to today, so uh, I just want to thank our panelists, uh, Ms. McGinnis, Mr. Davis, for appearing 
with the committee today. Please be advised that members may submit written questions to be answered later in writing. Those questions and your answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. Any members wishing to submit questions or any extraneous material for the record may do so within seven days. Again, thanks to our panelists. And with that, this committee stands adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John.